How are you doing? I am doing pretty good. How are you doing yourself there? Well, could be better, could be worse. I just had a terrible migraine that interestingly lasted on the left side of my head. Consider That's strange considering 97% of my migraines on my life occurred on the right side of my head. Don't suffer from them as much as I used to, but it seems like whenever I have one on the left side of my head, it's because uh, it's a sign of some high forms of energy affecting me. So in a sense, it's a it's a spiritual blessing, even though it's a, a pain because it's a sign of high energy. But hey, a headache's over. Uh, is it hurting right now still? No, it's gone gone just in okay, time good. for the show so <laughs> make, make that whatever you will so uh great to be talking to you man and uh even though we're in a mercury retrograde i've still been able to this is the, my third show in in as many days um don't do that often just had to do a thursday oh, wow. show because my guest had to <clears throat> can only do thursday so uh it's great to have you on let's hope mercury retrograde doesn't affect us in terms of technical glitches of ice my angels and guides <laughs> to be with both you and me to guide us and protect us on this so we can get information out there that is of the highest good. And um, uh, by the way, UnleashingNaturalHumanity.com, that is your official site, is it not? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, because on your Facebook page it says uh, Healer Student of Life, as if you're a student at that site, not necessarily your page, but I see it is your page, so I guess I'll uh, use that maybe as a guide throughout this show, but hey, let's just add live and let our angels and guides guide us. Uh, first of all, looking at your picture, you look familiar. Have I seen you somewhere before? Were you by any chance at any of Rob Potter's um, conferences in Mount Chest the last two years? Uh, yeah, actually, I was. I was the guy doing the implant removals there. That was you, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I hugged the tree uh, right in front of you, the tree that actually was made up of two parts, so I got a double. Oh, yes, hi, was... Andrew. I remember you. Yes, you do remember me, yes. I totally do. Hi, how's it going? It's been a while now. <clears throat> yes, it is. And uh, I don't think Rob Potter's doing a conference at Mount Shasta this year. He's doing one in South America, uh, yeah. which um, is kind of good because, uh, well, I don't know how I can work it out. I've really wanted to do ayahuasca this year. I saved up a lot of airline miles on my American Airlines and United Airlines award program just to be able to do that. And it would be great if I could kill two birds with one stone by doing that ceremony at the same in the same trip that I go to Rob Potter's conference if I go there. That would be real um, cool. That, that lady Tracy, who worked for Rob Potter, but un unfortunately uh, left parted ways with him because of some problems. So I'm really going to get into that. But uh, she's yeah. having two conferences at uh, <clears throat> Mount Shasta in June. One that's like three days long, another one that's five days. The latter is more of a healing session one, which I think maybe you'd like more. So I'll try to make it to both. But um, maybe I'll I'll see you there. But hey, enough. Uh, I enough. am actually putting one on myself in Shasta this year. We don't have dates nailed down yet, but it's going to be at the end of July, early August ish, and. Uh, uh, I'm going to be putting one on myself, unlocking the body, and then teaching people how to do this energy work directly. And are you going to invite speakers? Uh, well, if I get the opportunity, I might as well. You know, um, I'm not really looking to do that. It's more of just a uh, like a retreat type of a thing. Mm. But yeah, if that turns out to be what it's going to be, that's what it'll be. I'm trying to keep it more of a smaller group. I don't want it bigger than 50 people, and I'm pretty sure I can fill that no problem. Mm. Well, when it when when it comes to me and traveling. It's only I don't really go to go on vacations or go to healing and relaxation sessions as I go to conference where educational speakers are at so I can get enlightened for the sake of doing this show and enlighten <laughs> other people there. So oh, um, no, no, I, if you, I don't come to wait, your conference because no, of that, hope you don't take a, offense. But oh, I don't worry about it, Andrew. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Yeah. But you completely misunderstand. This is nothing but an informational and uh, in uh, it, this is all about figuring out the keys, which are the body. It's finding out how to unlock your DNA and figuring out how to become literally enlightened, as in putting the light in your body so that you can start unlocking abilities that, you know, they say are impossible to do. And this is kind of what Unleashing Natural Humanity is about, because once we start removing these blockages, you have natural abilities that are already there that you can start working with. And so that's kind of what this is all about. We're waking people up to the majesty that they have within themselves, the fact that they're a self-contained healing unit that doesn't need anything from the outside. They can cure themselves from the inside out. And we've got proof about this. You know, we've got people who are curing themselves from like hepatitis, you know, like uh, regrowing spleens, you know, all kinds of really interesting stuff. It's um, it's very interesting how this is all coming about. You know, the rising frequencies in the planet, it's just getting more and more intense, you know, and it's allowing access to higher and higher frequencies of ability and awareness. And this is kind of where we're headed with all of this. So it's not just, uh, you know, we're, we, we, I am a speaker, you know, I'm I'm one of these people who gives these inform this information. So it's not really geared towards. 
uh, you know, what's happening with the information and whatnot. It's more along the lines of what can you do yourself specifically to start helping along with the shift and transition? What can you do for yourself to get yourself out of pain? What can you do to cal calm your thoughts, bring yourself back into center? You know, things like that, because these things that we're pulling out right here, these aren't, you know, some woo-woo esoteric, this might be in there. The, if there's something inside the body that's causing a specific problem right then and there, as soon as you remove it, you feel it immediately gone. So say, for instance, there's pain in the body, you can immediately pull that out. If it's not physically caused, if there's not a reason for it, you can pull it directly out. And, you know, this is stuff that you feel immediately. The blood flow opens up, everything feels a lot better, and the pain literally disappears. If there's not a physical reason for it, it shouldn't be there. And so this is what we're actually starting to figure out. And it's, uh, it's a hell of a path, man. Like it's it's definitely interesting what we're starting to figure out, and people are really getting behind it, and it's actually getting way bigger, faster than I thought it would ever be. It's um really interesting the way this is going. It is indeed, and <clears throat> even though uh, don't take it personally, like I said, if I don't show, but then again, I, oh, I will say there are exceptions to that. Um, if, if I feel that going on a some sort of a retreat trip, like being an ayahuasca ceremony, like I said earlier, or something like this, I would treat it as an exception, but um, I really don't want to travel unless I can turn the trip into some sort of a, a mission, and vacations gotcha. aren't really missions, gotcha. but, but your but your oh, event no, was certainly it's... different than that, I think, so. <laughs> it's I not a vacation. People are going to have to actually prepare for this. You know, you're going to have to physically work out and get things moving and flowing, otherwise... When you come to this, it's gonna <laughs> you're gonna be way too sore to actually focus on anything else. It's not it's not a vacation. It's um we're we're fine. Have you ever heard of trauma release exercises? No, that phrase that you've just used. No trauma release exercises. Can't say I have. So animals don't display any type of uh, PTSD. They can you know show reactive behavior around specific people that cause them trauma, but then they can go to somebody else that hasn't given them that type of energy, and they can be completely and totally happy with that person. You know, they don't display any PTSD symptoms whatsoever, and it's because they go through these uh, spasmic shaking and seizuring types of motions that literally unwinds the trauma out of the physical musculature. And trauma release exercises are a way of burning out the legs until the point that you're shaking, you know, like when you uh, go on leg day and you work out so hard that your legs are trembling. Like, and you get to that point, and then you can actually hold your legs together in like a butterfly stretch position and start bringing them closer together and bringing your knees to actually touch. And what happens is it takes almost a half hour to get all the way from your legs fully open to close because you start finding these trigger points that send you into these uncontrollable spasms and uh, seizures that it's literally unwinding the trauma. They use these for like PTSD sufferers, like people coming just right after, off of the battlefield, you know, and instead of having to go into a, a dark room and talk about their problems, they're literally taking the physical kick in the gut from the trauma and removing that, and then they can logically process it without having to go through like all the flashbacks and stuff like that. It's, uh, you know, that's one of the aspects of stuff that we're going to be doing. You know, it's a complete and total unlocking of the physical foundation that stretches out into the mind, body, spirit aspect. And it's, um, trauma re release exercises are a very, very interesting, uh, modality. Like the more I look into these, the more amazing it is. You can actually start. Um, like you hear about these people who are blank slated, you know, the 20 and back programs and stuff like that. The TREs actually start to unwind some of the blank slating so that you can get a foothold into the door and then start processing the memories out and fully get recall. Like it's it's really interesting what's happening here. It's uh, it, it's it's everything. It's like, you know, every single slice of the pie. This is all focused on the center is what they're doing to the body. And so what we're doing to the body is unlocking it and following the pathways, what they're using to shut us down and figuring out how to turn all this back on and so that's kind of what we're doing but no it's 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 not a vacation it's going to be one of the uh the toughest weeks that somebody's actually gone through um it's it's emotionally mentally physically energetically it's going to be turning out juggernauts you know this is what we have to start moving into like uh I've worked on almost 3,000 clients. I'm, in, I'm somewhere at around the 2,900 range, and it's only getting stronger, and I'm really getting pulled towards the uh, the physical interaction because there's only so much advertising you can do with, like, email and Facebook and stuff like that. You know, I need to start getting into the physical face-to-face -face interactions because there are things that each one of us can do that 
it's literally impossible compare uh, what with what Western medical science says is available, and we can do these 100 percent of the time, and we can prove it anytime, any time, any place, anywhere. And you know, it, despite the fact that even if somebody going through this work isn't an energetic sensitive, they can still feel this work. They'll feel the increased blood flow. They'll feel the uh, the calming in the head. They won't have noise inside their head unless they're actively thinking it. You know, like if you say hello inside your head, you hear a hello. You know, unless if you are actively thinking it. You don't hear anything, and you know that's natural humanity. And so you start feeling relaxed into your body and really feeling these things. People who are energetically sensitive and actually doing work beforehand, uh, it's absolutely amazing what happens when they come into contact with actually removing the blockages that are holding them down. You know, it's because you find people in the energetic world who they say that you know, I, well, I've been doing meditation practices and energetic work for years and years and years, yet I can't use my third eye. It's well, they, the work that they're doing, it is effective. It's just that they're literally trying to like raise themselves up. And so the more that they get buoyant, the more they try to lift themselves up, the more pressure gets put down on top of them. And so as soon as we re remove this pressure, I'm like, my work is getting so easy now. I just remove a couple things off of people and they literally snap into alignment and clean themselves out. Suddenly they're completely pain free, no noise inside the head. You know, they're completely connected into the body and they can feel their chi flow. It's like they've got blood connecting in on a cellular level more exponentially than ever before, you know, and these are things that anybody can feel. And that's why this work is so incredible because anybody can even read about this stuff and try it and they can actually feel everything happening inside of their body in real time. And it's, you know, you don't need me to do this for you. This is something that anybody can do. You just have to actually do it, you know, and like the, um, the ancient Chinese, they mapped a lot of this stuff out through the meridian points and the energetic centers of the body. And so there's already roadmaps and pathways that we can use to just follow along here. And it's really absolutely phenomenal what is growing out of this. These people are starting to literally step into a place of power to where they don't need a guru because – don't get me wrong. you know, I do kind of stand out there and I do talk a lot about this stuff, but I'm not the ultimate authority. Uh, the ultimate authority is always from within. You know, it's, it's what do you feel about it. And so that's what we're really trying to stress here is getting people to understand that, hey, there are a few things that you can do to open this up. But the real journey of this is to recognize that you have a complete and total open connection to source once you figure out where it's at and start working on unblocking it. You don't need a guru. You don't need anybody to tell you what to do. You don't need a healer. You are your own self-contained healer. So, you know, my uh, my – my uh, title on Facebook, it's kind of misleading. I am a healer in some aspects, yes, but for the most part, I'm an energetic blockage remover. That's all I do. I remove blockages that keep people from healing themselves, and so they do. And it's, um, it's really interesting the way this is going. All right, and with that being said, how best way to do this show, I guess, like I said, use your um, site as a guide, and I guess even though anybody could um, – go to your site to answer these questions i think i don't really know of a better way i could possibly host this show than to ask you the same questions that you have in the faq and ask you to go over some of the things you wrote in your three articles i see here but um <clears throat> i don't i don't think we have to answer all of these questions individually we can maybe kill a few birds with one stone you're looking at them uh first yeah. question i should ask is probably the the third one actually um what is a parasite what is an implant how are they different can you compare and contrast parasites and implants Okay, so um, well, let's actually throw a third one in there, entities as well. So uh, an implant is an etheric device. It is something that is placed inside of the body for a specific reason. It's not conscious. It's more along the lines of a tool. Um, a parasite inside of the body, it is a conscious uh, uh, co co coalescence of energy that actually can work in real time around you and your nervous system. So it's constantly monitoring what's happening inside your body. And so any thought processes or anything like that that start leading you towards a path of awakening or, you know, healing yourself or cleaning your body out, uh, it'll actively work against. You know, this is what they call, um, I believe Lisa Renee, she's the one who coined this term, the SPE, the suppressor parasite entity. And this is the one that's constantly keeping you stuck in the past or in the future. And, um, it keeps you out of the now. It's constantly just a monkey mind chattering away inside your head. So the way you know if you have this is just give yourself 30 seconds of silence and ask yourself or tell yourself I am going to remain silent and I'm not going to talk inside my head. And so if you have anything pop up, you've got something. You know, it's as simple as that. It's just paying attention to what's going on. Most of our symptoms that we think we have are not uh, normal. You know, they're they're actually symptoms. You know, like the the parasite inside the head and whatnot. So it's a, a conscious parasite that is actively working against your ascension 
and connecting into these energies. A, an entity is just like a parasite, except that the parasite is stuck inside the body. It's not big enough to actually exist outside of the body, so this is something that's working inside of you. An entity is the same exact thing as a parasite, a malevolent consciousness that's outside of the body instead of on the inside. And so these are the things that actually create and implant the devices themselves. And so you, you've got implants, parasites, and entities. These are all kind of part of the implantation system. You know, it kind of goes into sub groups and stuff like that, but that's kind of a basic overview right there. Uh, thank you. And in regards to <clears throat> removing them, um, different takes on this. I've had a couple um, experiences um, with this, I guess. I don't mean to bore anybody, but I think it makes sense for me to explain what I've been through. And maybe uh, some people, when they comment on this um, video, could um, explain how they had their own implants removed, and we can see how many different ways there are to do this. But I, um, first of all, I found out that I did have at least one implant in me, um, when I was at Ted Mars conference in Washington, uh, last year, not the recent one in March, but the March before this past March. And, uh, actually it was in June of 2016. And, uh, during some of the talks, something happened to me that had happened many times, um, before at conferences where like, I'd say maybe 25% of the presentations that I listened to at conferences, this happened to me. Um, I would feel extremely fatigued when the presenter was talking. Even if I took a caffeine pill before the presenter, I would still feel extremely fatigued. And um, Scott Lemriel, when I asked him about it, when he asked me how I was doing, I said, it's annoying that this is happening to me. He said, you got an implant that's causing that. And um, I was like, oh, okay, so how can I remove it? And he said, well, there's a couple of uh, entities around you, benevolent consciousness entities that are willing to remove it if you ask them. So where did that come from? I thought at the time, but hey, I, I, he has the ability to read that apparently. So I believe that and I asked them to remove it and he claims that they did. And But that, I still had a couple more he claimed that they had not removed there. And so <laughs> later in the conference, I asked one of the speakers to remove um, re remove the implant, whatever implants were still in me, and he claimed he did when he did a little healing session on me when I was standing near him, and uh, he said, next time you take a crap in the bathroom, it's their implants will be ejected from you. And, uh, well, the re a couple weeks ago, uh, Greg Mara had him as a guest on my show, and he was willing, because, as a reward, a token of gratitude for me allowing him to be a guest on my show, he did a healing on me where one of the things he said he did was remove my my implants, any implants that I had, and I had reason to think, well, maybe I was implanted again, because for a little time after I had the um, implant removed, um, that seemed to make me feel fatigued during con live conference presentations. I, um, it happened again at Rob Potter's uh, Secret Space Conference last year when Michael Sala and Corey Good were giving their talks, and I was like, oh my god, did the, did the Archons just implant me again? I mean, how, what's the sense in removing these implants if they're just going to keep implanting you, I thought. Well, Greg Mara did release them. I was at the uh, Free Your Mind conference um, this past weekend, and um, I don't recall having to fall asleep or feeling fatigued during any of those uh those talks. So even though some people did tell me that Greg Mar, you got to be careful with him because he's a recovering alcoholic and uh, some people question his abilities. It well seemed to work on me. Um, and he, um, I, I thought everything was uh, taken out of me in terms of implants. Although a couple times during Michael Tsarian, when he was talking, I did by myself nodding off a little bit, but that may have been because that was at the end of my caffeine buzz. And I was at that time worrying about the possibility that I had been implanted again. I remember, and maybe the worry about being implanted again, maybe caused a little bit of a slight placebo effect on me to make me feel fatigued, even though maybe I wasn't implanted by that point. But those are my experiences. I've babbled long enough. What are some other ways to remove implants? And more, more important, important question is, I mean, how frequently would you have to do these implant removals? And is there anything you could do to cut back on the amount of times you have to get them? So the Archons, if they just keep implanting you over and over again, how can you prevent that for crying out loud? Any any advice on that? You got the floor. Uh, yeah, uh, learn how to do it yourself <laughs> so that you don't have to keep going to people. Um, like that, that's the name of the game right here. You don't want to have to rely on other people to do this for you. You want to learn how to do this yourself. And that's what the amazing part of this all is, you know, is that it's anybody can tap into this energy. Anybody can do these types of removals. You just have to start moving this energy within yourself. So like, um, 
I actually want to uh, hit on some of those people that you were talking about there. Uh, so Scott Lemriel, he was actually the catalyst that started this journey of mine. It was uh, not the last year, but the year before that at the um, Secret Space Conference in Shasta. And I heard him talking about these etheric implants, and this was maybe about uh, a year, year and a half since I'd actually became aware of them and had been working on myself and other people. And I'd only worked on maybe about 10, 15 people, you know, uh, various people online that I talked to and then uh, people throughout my um, – my practice because I was a massage therapist and physical therapist at the time. And so like it wasn't very many people that I'd actually worked on, but every single person that I had actually done this on, they all noticed the very similar things, you know, the silence in the mind, the pain-free body, the openness, the expansion, the, the just feeling good. And so I was just working on this and doing that. And so I hear Scott talking about it out of the corner of my ear and I kind of just go sidle on over into that conversation and so um, I, and I, I, I kind of like confirmed it. I was like, you're, you're talking about energetic implants, right? Not physical ones. And he said, yeah, the energetic ones, these are the ones that almost everybody has. And I told him, I was like, you know, I can remove those. I've been, I know how to see those. I've been working on that for about a year, year and a half now. And he just kind of gets quiet and he looks at me and he says, okay, so, well, when we're done with the speaker meeting, uh, I need to get to, I, I need to see you. I need to talk to you after that. And so uh, when the speaker meeting was done, like, so I didn't even know that he was a speaker there. So I didn't know that I was talking to um, Scott Lemriel. I had no clue who he was. I was just there to volunteer at the conference because I was guided to go to Shasta. And that's kind of how this all came about. And so I worked on him and he gets done and he tells me he feels way better than he has in a long time. And he says, now, you didn't get everything, but you've definitely got the first layer of these. And so then he went and told some people and I worked on like I, I think it was like 50 people that weekend. I mean, it was absolutely crazy how that all turned about. So, I mean, Scott was a catalyst to all this, how it began. And then Ted Marr actually was the one who got me on his show. I worked on him and um, he said that he always had some stuff going on. He was always so uh, Ted's a very, very accurate psychic. He's like within like a 95 to 99 percent accuracy rating. He's way, way better than most of the people out there. But it's because he knows how to discern. And he was telling me that he always ended up having the wrong answer and then the right answer. And he'd have to figure out which one was which. And so when we did the implant removal with him, all of a sudden he was only getting the right answer after that. And so he tells me, I have to have you on the show. And so like it was those two people right there. They were a huge platform for me to actually get out here into doing this full time so that I could do nothing but research this. And so, I mean, those guys, they're absolutely great. I can't, I can't stress enough how amazing both of those men are. Like they've done – so much work on their end to bring awareness to the planet. Like, I mean, major, major kudos to those guys. And Greg Mara, you know, there's definitely, I've heard some stuff about, like, you got to stay away from this guy, but you can't discount the message for the messenger in that line of sense. He does have some legitimate abilities. He is solely responsible for me being able to work on the higher self aspect of people now. Um, I came about this from the inside out. I was working on unlocking the body, and that led to um, a massage modality that actually unlocks the body way faster than just about anything else out there. It's called the fulcrum method. And uh, this is uh, my brainchild, actually, that once my work with the energy work is done, this is what I'm going to be teaching. But you can go deeper than deep tissue. You, you can unlock trauma directly inside of the body and you can do it about 10 to 15 times faster and it hurts nowhere near as much. You actually stay underneath the pain threshold. And so like this modality right here, it actually led me directly into the energetic awareness of the way the tension works inside the body, which led directly to the implant awareness. And so that's kind of where everything went and how I'm working on that right now. But uh, so I came from the inside out. Greg comes from a much higher perspective. He comes from the angelic perspective. He is stuck inside the 3D reality, and his body went with the programming just like almost everybody else did into the point where he's at right now. And so he's actually opening up these awarenesses on a much higher level and doing this work despite the fact that he doesn't know quite a bit about the way the energy flows with the body and the way everything hooks in together. So he's working from the outside in. He is solely responsible for me awakening to that level right there. And without him, he was a major catalyst in that journey. So, you know, despite the fact that there is some stuff going on with him, you can't discount the fact that there are legitimate abilities going on right there. He does have a legitimate gift, and I've worked after him. People that I have worked out on afterwards, um, they, they're clean. They are absolutely clean. Things aren't connected and moving and flowing the way they're supposed to just because he doesn't have that awareness yet. But if once he does get it, he will have that awareness too. But people are clean. You can't say that he's not legitimately helping people out because he definitely is. And you noticed it as well. You didn't feel that fatigue. You didn't feel that adrenaline dump that shot you up and then crashed you down. 
during that conference. And, you know, when you're sitting through a whole entire conference, you know, that's like six, seven hours, something like that. At the end of the day, you're going to be tired regardless anyway. You know, that's just the natural ebb and flow the way that the body works. You know, so there's there's no just throwing the ba- – you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You want to actually look at what is happening in the whole aspect of it and then go with the, re- the results. You know, p- Some people had some n- adverse results. Some people had some really good results. It's all about what are you going to take from it. And so if you go into a session like that with the mindset and the energetic – uh, knowing of I am going to get what is best for me out of this. Anything else that is not mine shall follow around behind me. You know, it'll just be dissolved off. If you go into a session like that, you're going to get the best out of it, no matter who it is, no matter if that person is, um, you know, heavily infested with false light entities or if that person is pure and they're coming from a, a pure source. You know, regardless of where you go into it from that, you can have a session from somebody who's pretty infested and have a healing experience from it. You have to know what you're doing. You have to be be able to keep yourself clean. You have to understand what energetic hygiene is and be able to see these things. But it is possible, you know, because the, the altruistic energy is there, despite the fact that a lot of these people come into it and then they get led astray and it turns into more of like an ego stroking or like a money driven uh, profit society type of a, a, a thing that, you know, it ends up getting out of the core message, which is uh, the core message is constantly strive to be a better person than you were the day before. Uh, try to be more service to others. Try to give more to the world than you take. Um, you know, just be compassionate. Look at the world with love and compassion. If you don't want something happening to you, don't do it to other people, you know? And it's, it's simple. You know, these are the fundamental ten- tenets in every major world religion. And the base of it is just don't be an asshole, you know? Just be nice to everybody. And what happens is what you put out, that's what you start getting back. And so that's the base core of what you really want to be following is and you want to look at what the message is for everybody out there you know you want to find out what they're actually talking about we don't want to build a a system that is dependent on uh, a group we are trying to build a system of independent creative gurus who go who go into the world and shine the light like you don't have to be like me you don't have to be out there talking like this you don't have to be out there doing this work in order to be effective you can be keeping yourself clean and clear and what that does is that actually keep, keeps you at a vibrational level that's much higher than the average of uh, most people who are stuck underneath these energetic systems and just by being at that vibrational resonance you don't even have to talk to people you just have to come into contact contact with their field and you literally start becoming a point of light, a beacon, a lighthouse that is traveling through this reality that people feel. They don't understand it. They don't know why they're drawn to that energy, but there's something about that person that they want to figure out what's going on. And this allows you to broach the subject. You know, it's like, well, what's happening? You are not the same person than you were just even like five months ago, the last time I saw you. You know, like what's happening here? Like this is completely and totally different. What what are you doing? You know, and this allows you to open up a conversation with somebody who's completely unaware. You know, it's like, look, I've been doing some energy work inside myself that has been changing my life. I feel completely and totally different. And you can leave it at that, you know, and this is a huge awakening platform for people who aren't in the know, who don't understand about these things, because these subjects have been widely known in very, very small circles around the world. But now they are actually starting to widen into the circles. You know, it, it's it's a. Uh, um, it's becoming much more known to a much broader broader group of people. This was kind of like a spiritual echelon type of a, um, elite type of a knowledge, you know, and it was hidden and passed down throughout history, you know, all the way from like when they wiped out the Gnostics and, you know, the Nag Hammadi texts and stuff like that where they were actually trying to tell people about these systems. And now it's actually starting to come back and it's becoming much, much more – widespread in the knowledge and in your face like we're watching the world hit a place right now that is one of the darkest resonances that it's ever been and that's because the energetic side is losing its touch it's losing its ability to keep us in this fear-based matrix keep us inside of this uh problem reaction solution uh paradigm that's worked since time immemorial inside of the same loop we're starting to see it and we're starting to schism outside of it and they're cracking down as hard as they can because the energetic systems just aren't working the stand down codes aren't working anymore people are starting to think they're starting to wonder they're starting to question and it's directly from people actually turning on 
the light inside, you know, and this isn't something that even if you energetically don't know how to work like that, this is as something as simple as putting a smile inside of your heart space and shining it out. You know, it's like taking the feeling of that smile, you know, that happiness that you feel when you have a genuine smile and take that feeling and place it inside of your heart, place it inside of your body anywhere, you know, take a big deep breath in through it, you know, and it's as simple as looking for the brighter things in life and recognizing that there's a lot of darkness here in the world that we need to be aware of. But what we need to be aware of is that we can shift it. Everything is energy. When we break it all down to the subatomic molecular structure, you know, we look at the the um, the atoms and they're all 99.999% empty and you go inside of those and the protons, neutrons and electrons are made up of uh, quarks and quarks are just as empty as the uh, the atom itself is. You know, so it's all hollow and it's all it is is just a crystallized version of energy, the chi, the energy that we're using in here. And the energy is the higher dimensional emotional component of it that you can actually direct and this is what they're – goal is this is what they're feeding off of is your higher dimensional energy that's been turned dark and nasty and so when we start recognizing all of this stuff and coming back into the body and recognizing that every single one of us has god inside of us we are an aspect of source we are a splinter of god itself and we don't need to reach outside for that all of a sudden you start looking at things like the higher self and the angelic realms and stuff like that as just another aspect of you. And so you can start to stretch out into that. And so that's what this is all about is recognizing that there's light inside of everybody and it doesn't matter how dark you get. Uh, it took me finding the darkest point in my life to recognize there's a light inside that I could turn on before I could shine it. You know, I was contemplating suicide for a good three months before I recognized that there is a light inside and it doesn't matter how deep and how far into the dark you go you can always find your way back you can always just let go of the past and you can stay in the now and hold on to the light now and what that does is that decision to shift into the brighter side you actually start to see these things in the world around you um you know like we were talking about with the energetic nature of reality the the hollowness of the subatomic structure it's just a different form of the chi so like if we were to take uh, water for instance we can freeze it and turn it to, into ice we can leave it alone leave it liquid or we can heat it up and turn it into gas you know there's three different forms of the same type of structure and that's what we're looking at with the physical reality around us this physical reality is nothing more than the quote ice of the energy of the chi and so we can interact directly with the energy around us by recognizing this multidimensionality. And this is the awareness that we've been shut off from that we're actually starting to recognize. We're removing these blockages and we're opening ourselves up to this understanding and it's starting to actually show in the physical reality around us. There's physical things and changes that are being seen, not just in the, the on the world level with uh, you know like the craziness that's happening, but individually. We're watching people literally heal themselves from chronic issues, you know, the surgeries and stuff like that, the scars are disappearing, you know. It, it's it's really amazing what's actually coming out of this. It's um sometimes I have to step back and really kind of pinch myself like is this real? Like oh wow, this is a very interesting path that we're going down here. Yes, it gets more and more interesting every every day for that matter. And moving on with the FAQ here, um what needs to be done after removal, after care and protection, etc. Well, um I I'd like to once again kill two birds with one stone here and uh also ask you in addition to answering this uh the whole thing you said about learn how to do it yourself well i mean that's easier said than done for some people so um well first of all i think i should should ask you right now right off the bat um what um allows you to be blessed for lack of a better word in regards to being able to do this i mean is it because you have dna codes that are active to a greater extent that allow you to do this relative to other people is it something in your aura or is it you've tra trained yourself more over over time or and you acknowledge and believe that the force is with you to a point that allows you to do this better than than other people so what is what is the key to your secret that allows you to manifest this potential that everybody has more easily than other people um so it's the same with anything else you know how do you see the master surge and getting to the point where they were at you know it's 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 years of practice and research and dedication to the craft 
Um, you know, so when I started my journey off in the martial arts world when I was five years old, and just by being able to move my body in these very specific ways and understand exactly where I was with the reality around me. So if like I threw my leg up over here, I could throw it in front of somebody's face and I could, you know, whip it as hard as I could and I could miss them by a quarter of an inch because I know exactly where my body is at. And so this awareness really gave me an internal understanding that a lot of people don't have. And so that's one of the reasons I highly recommend people get into some type of a martial art or a yoga or a dance or something to where they actually get in and move and feel their body and actually flow inside of it because it gives you a body awareness that it's um, it's a little bit more comprehensive than just floating around and knowing that you have a head, arms, legs, feet, and you know, a pelvis and a torso. It lets you know that how your musculature attaches, how everything moves and how it flows together. And so that's where my awareness actually started. And so I went through the beginning of my life all the way up until I was about 16 or 17 years old training fairly regularly. I'd stop every, you know, month or two, something like that. But for the most part, I was doing these martial art, uh, the martial arts for a long time. And um, it just ingrained a knowing and understanding inside of my body and recognizing where it was and how it moved and what was going on inside of it. And so when I started recognizing, uh, what I was doing with my body was actually energy work because I do other things that I thought was just like playing with sensation. Um, so there was one thing I would do when I was a kid, I called it the brain clench or the mind clench. I would just tighten up a spot inside of my head and it was usually right um not in the third eye area but maybe about two inches up right at the hairline i would tighten that spot right there and then i could start to move that tight spot around inside of my head and so it got to the point where i was playing around with this so much that i could split that into four pieces and then i could rotate these independently inside of my head i'd have some going uh vertical and some going horizontal and I recognize now that I was doing like some pretty hardcore Qigong techniques. Like I was moving sensation and flow inside of my body. And even if you can't connect that to the site, if you can't see that to the energy, when you move sensation inside your body like that, you are moving qi. And so I recognized I was doing a lot of things that were keeping myself a bit more open than other people. And so I got hit way harder. My whole entire, um, geez, my life it from about 18 up until about 26, it was uh, some of the darkest stuff that I've ever seen in my life. And, you know, it I know other people have gone through a lot worse stuff than I have, but a lot of people haven't. You know, I, I was homeless. I was living under a bridge. I was addicted to methamphetamines. I mean, there was all kinds of really bad, bad, evil, wicked stuff that I was a part of. I was part of that culture that you look at and you have to be careful of, you know, and that's where I was. And that's how my whole entire life led up to that point, you know, and so when I was able to find the light and turn that back on, it was a complete and total transformation that opened everything up. And so when I came back from that, I had all this awareness and understanding of how dark reality is and how dark humanity can be. And I was living it and I thought it was just, you know, the dregs of humanity. And now with this awareness, I understand and I can look back on it and I can see all of that. But so I had an opportunity once I turned the light on, uh, I got out of um, everything. I dropped everything and I took my daughter and I moved to California and I went and I lived with my mom at 26 years old and I didn't have a job. I didn't have anything. Uh, and I had my daughter. And so I ended up getting on welfare and food stamps and I was living on about four hundred dollars a month. And I was going to massage school because I knew that I had to do something. And so I didn't look at this time where I had no money and I was stuck as a bad thing. I looked at it as an opportunity for me to have no money to do anything that was distracting whatsoever. So I worked out. I exercised. I did yoga. I sun gazed. I, um, you know, I did all kinds of different stuff that it was leading to this transformation that allowed me to uh, integrate the chakra system into the actual golden frequency. Um, I'll explain that in a bit too. Um, so everything that I did, my whole entire path, it was just because I happened to be led into keeping these pathways open. Just because I kept these pathways open doesn't mean that everybody else who has them closed off cannot open them again. It's just the opposite. It means that they're there, that it just, it's, that they're blocked. You can open them back up. Anybody can. It just takes time and effort. And there's very specific things that you can do. Like Qigong is absolutely amazing. Uh, Qigong, Qigong, uh, Qigong, uh, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's the movement of the body and coupling it with the energy flow inside the body, coupling it with the sensation inside the body. And specifically Shaolin Qigong. Um, 
it is some of the most powerful stuff that you can do. They're very, very simple movements, and they open things up on a level that is – it's it's hard to understand. I was strong before. I was aware before. When I started doing this, that's when everything blew wide open for me. I can see uh, multiple levels of the body just like an MRI because I have all these parts connected in through these movements. It's the central channels, the governing vessel meridian and the conception vessel meridian up the spine and down the front. This flow, the internal microcosmic orbit right here, if this is strong, this powers all the other major organ meridians, and that keeps everything clean, that keeps everything open, that keeps you nice and fresh and strong and able to heal yourself, and not only that, it keeps your energetic organic machinery or your hardware, your glands inside the body powered with fresh supplies of chi so that you have these abilities that you can keep open. So yes, I was able to do this uh, and where other people couldn't, that was because I kept everything open. I can show everybody how to open this stuff back up and access this frequency so that everybody can open this into their body because this isn't, and you know, I'm not the only one that can do this though. Everybody can access into this frequency if they fight and push and hard, uh, hard enough through the sledge, you know, and, and it's just, I know how to do it easier. I know how to see these systems on people and remove it so that we can have a blank slate. You have the A in the class. Now it's up to you to keep it. You have the awareness of what it's like to not be under that energetic blanket, that heaviness that was pulling you down that you had no clue about your whole entire life. And so now that you have the awareness of what it's like not to have it, you will notice when it comes back and it'll be simple to take care of it because you've got so much of a flow already. And so that's that's what this is about. I don't want people to come back to me over and over and over again to uh, have an extraction. If anything, what I want. If you want to come back to me again, come back for a coaching session. I will see the energy inside your body and walk you exactly how to remove it. And then if you're uh, not able to do that, I'll still clean you out. So I've only had one person come back for three coaching sessions. Uh, the most I've had other than that was two, and that's three different people. For the most part, it only takes one. Once you sit with this energy for more than two or three weeks and you're actually able to work with it, you recognize where it's at. So if stuff, stuff starts to come back and I see it, I can show you exactly where it's at, and then you get the hands-on experience, hands experience of pulling this out of your body yourself because I don't want everybody to keep coming back to me. I'm booked out a ridiculous amount of time right now. I've only got my books going out 60 days. I'm booked all the way up until them. Each time a day moves forward, I have three people that jump into those slots immediately. So I don't have enough time for this. I don't have enough time for the individual focus on everybody that we need. There's so many people who needs this work. But what I can do is teach people how to do this, how to keep themselves clean, how to clear other people out. And that's what this is all about. That's what we're trying to do. I'm not special. I'm not a guru. Anybody can do this. And that's the bottom line to it. That's just the bottom line there. Well, I'm doing my part indeed. I take Tai Chi every Monday from 7 to 8 p.m. and also Aikido every Sunday and hopefully going to take it more than, Aikido more than once a week. Uh, maybe take yoga when the summertime comes that's another option i have with the nature reserve that's near me so i'm doing my part so i don't have to see people like you <laughs> but um hey we all should you you made that very clear just now and uh feel bad for you that you booked man i'm a very busy busy guy too i try not to have too much free time for whatever the reason but you know all work and no play makes jack a dull boy so try to try to help us <laughs> yeah. out will you okay but um enough of that um Moving on uh, to the other FAQ, uh, Meridian Energy uh, Center Clearing and Rebalancing. Okay, uh, rebalancing. When I hear, see that word, I mean, immediately I think of chakras. I mean, there's there's some people that are in the camp of you don't need chakras. That's all 3D matrix. George Kavaslis, of course, is uh, is kind of in the camp. He tries to uh, pressure the idea of dissolving all your chakras into one. I mean, I I, I, I say more, more power to you, George, if you can do that and have fun in life. But some people got to use all their chakras for the sake of variety because variety it, it's one of those spices of life, and you're kind of missing out on the fun if you don't if you don't do that. And um, when it comes to energy center clearing, well, energy center where is the center is uh is it the heart or the one point as we in aikido would refer to um and the meridian what what, what is that the middle of it's the meridian it goes down the middle of something so what i'm, I'm asking too many questions all at once here <laughs> could you um clarify this and clear this up for me and people that want to know this yeah definitely yeah <laughs> 
so first and foremost, they are meridians. They are a, a thing. It's a, a flow of energy inside the body. It is not a meridian as in dividing the line down the center. It is just called a meridian. Um, another way, it's just a flow of energy inside the body. And so we have 12 major organ meridians inside the body. One corresponds to each of the major organs in the body. So the ones that start in the hands, you've got lungs, heart, pericardium, large intestine, small intestine, triple heater. The ones that start in the face, you've got urinary bladder, kidney, stomach, spleen, and uh, liver and gallbladder. And so these actually are the energy centers that flow through the, uh, they connect into the central channels, those governing vessels up the spine and down the front that we were talking about, and they power your organs. And so if these start to get stagnant and locked up, they can actually start to stagnate and lock up physically the organ itself. So uh, say, for instance, you've got somebody who's been drinking their whole life for the past 30 years and they've got cirrhosis of the liver. Um, you can go in there and start cleaning this liver meridian out and opening it up and bringing the flow back so that you can start rehabilitating that organ. It doesn't matter how far gone it is. As long as it's not dead, you can bring something back to the edge. And that's how we actually do that with these meridians right here. So say, for instance, that you've got um, you know, a, a kidney that isn't operating correctly, like you've got too much water weight that uh, retains itself on the left side of the body. And that's the kidney that's doing that. You can find where that's blocked up. You can hook that back in turn that meridian back on after cleaning the sludge out, and then all of a sudden that kidney starts flushing the way that it's supposed to, and then it brings function back to the organ itself. Um, now, energy centers themselves, I call them energy centers because uh, chakras, there's just too much around that word. It's a label that so many people put things around it. I just don't like it. Now, as for the seven-layered chakra centers, uh, this is what I was talking about with the golden frequency right here. Like you were talking about variety is the spice of life. Completely and totally get you. This isn't about um, just saying no to everything else. This isn't, I'm not going to use the violet flame. I'm not going to use the blue protection. This is actually using everything. So when we take a beam of sunlight and we break it apart with a prism, we can see every single visible light spectrum color that's inside of there, the red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And that's all coming from this brilliant white gold that is the sunlight. Uh, what we're not seeing, unfortunately, is the other 95% of the light spectrum, the invisible light spectrum. That's where these entities and implants are actually hiding inside of. We've got X-ray, gamma ray, uh, gamma ray, infrared, ultraviolet, uh, scalar. We've got all kinds of different frequencies of light that we can't see. And so what happens when you have this seven-colored chakra layer is that this 5% of energy that you can see, you're cutting it into seven points. And that uh, mathematically breaks down to exactly 0.714% of the entirety. So when you're limiting yourself into these seven layer chakra centers, you are limiting each point into literally less than 1% of what it's supposed to be able to access. The golden frequency is finding that unity and integrating it back into the whole. It's not saying that I am exclusionary and I'm only going to use this. It's like, no, I'm going to use everything. And what happens when you actually turn your energy centers onto the golden frequency and integrate the whole aspect, there's three points that pop up. They're called the Dantians and they're also known as the belly or as the uh, the bot three brains of the body so the uh, Dantians have been mapped out in the Chinese culture same as these meridians and acupuncture points for thousands and thousands of years you know this isn't new information right here this is old old stuff but what is new is math or uh, mathematically scientifically we can actually in utero watch a fetus develop now and what we see is as the brain is developing it's a massive neuronal tissue that then splits into three parts one becomes the head one becomes part of the heart and then one becomes the intestines the intestines are literally neuronal tissue that roll like a coil inside the body. So get this. The Tesla coil is actually a mimic of the human body itself. We've got the open source that we can interact with, the ball up on the top. That's what we think with. That's what we can interact with. We've got the transformer in the center. That's the heart. We can't interact with it. It just does a job. And unless you know how to interact with it, you can't adjust the field. Now, the coil is literally, what do we have in our, our stomachs? We have a coil of intestines of neuronal tissue that flow down. And so the coil, it's the energy flow from the Tesla coil as it reaches the transformer and it goes to the open source of the ball that you can actually interact with. And so that's kind of what's happening here is you're opening up these three brains of the body. The neuronal tissue in the brain is the conscious, the neuronal tissue of the heart, it's conscious, and the neuronal tissue of the belly, it's conscious. You know, follow your gut, the belly brain, you know, stuff like this. And so these are the points of the body that are the natural points that once you integrate into the golden frequency, once you bypass the exclusionary, this is what my layers are, and you integrate the whole into your field, this is what explodes out. And they are, like when you do a meditation to actually, um, 
integrate your seven layer chakra centers and it's as simple as just feeling each one intensely and then overlaying it on top of this brilliant white golden uh almost like you've got these points floating in an ocean of white gold and then you just open them up and integrate them and the gold comes rushing in and if you're not ready for this hardly anything will happen but if you are ready for this and you've done the work and you've got enough energy buffered to the point that you can activate this you will have an explosion of energy that it it's like so my heart space, I couldn't push into it. I had a, a magnetic pushback from within about a foot and a half of my heart space that it was intense. And the heat inside of it, it was about 35 degrees hotter than the ambient temperature anywhere else. And it was so hot that it was burning my chin. Like, I mean, this was an intense, intense activation. And that's actually the uh, the activation that got me aware of these systems. I became so high vibration at that point in time that they couldn't exist inside of me. And so I felt a snap and a click where it got blown loose inside my head. And so it start, started to slide back, and I could feel it and track this thing, and that, that's how this whole thing all came about. I ended up pulling these dark spots out of my body and felt fantastic, absolutely amazing, better than I ever had in my life. And I thought I was going insane. I absolutely thought I lost it. I had, you know, crazy stuff happening inside my head, stuff inside my body. And yet I had these results that were right there in front of me. And, you know, my chin was starting to like literally blister and sunburn from the heat that was coming from my heart. You know, so this is stuff right here that when you do this and integrate into the whole entire frequency instead of just that 5%, you can handle thousands of times the magnitude of energy than you did before. And so when you start working in conjunction with this energy right here and working with other people and cleaning it out, it's like you're coming from a perspective that is uh, the whole entirety of the spectrum instead of just that little tiny sliver. And so this is why people took so long to do energy work in the past. It's because they had to take that little sliver and then focus on this for like an hour. You know, that's why these meditations or, you know, these things took so long when I always never understood it because I could push against something and I would feel it done. And it's like, well, why am I sitting here still doing this? It's over and done with. And that's, you know, kind of what I'm understanding how that all makes sense now because the golden frequency is the entirety of it. It is the full entire light spectrum, including the light spectrum that cannot be seen where all these entities and parasites and implants reside. And so it's a multidimensional function of the DNA and the light and the understanding of the body, mind, soul complex that actually allows this. So it's, um, like I said, it's a really interesting path that this is all going down. Yes, yes, and you could name your um, radio program Golden Frequency Radio. Now I know where that name comes from and what that's all about. Um, yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, let, let's get back to that question that I wanted to ask you, but then I instantly switched to gears about how you have this power, that, so to speak. But anyhow, um, what needs to be done after removal, aftercare, and protection? And when it comes to aftercare and protection, I, I think of uh, Daniel Teague, who I've um, – paid to do a bunch of healings on on people whose names i'm not going to name because it's i think uh, that would ruin the magic of it well he says that it wouldn't but but anyhow um he when he does clearings on like clearing out negative energies out of a given location he'll has the ability to put protection over it so the negative energies wouldn't be able to to return and um but that's um a more of a given location like a house or something this is more um what you do is more conducive to a body mind and, and spirit kind of thing not really a place of residence um but uh how, how do you go about um or how someone who like let's say they have the ability to re remove their the implants on their own i guess that's what we're trying to get people to do here so after someone who does that um how do they uh prevent like the um entities from coming back with aftercare and protection and for that matter when you do healings on people um if this is a fair question to ask for all the people that are going to see you in the future how do i know that after you heal me it's not going to be a waste because they're not just going to come and attack me afterwards after x amount of days weeks or months what what kind of protection can you give me if you if you if you do this to me so what do you do and what can people do in regards to aftercare and protection to make sure they don't come back <laughs> um, so 
I can clean the mud off of you, but if you go jump back in the mud puddle, how am I going to guarantee you that you're going to stay clean? You know, there's after work that needs to be done. There's care that needs to be done. You know, you constantly have to be working and striving to keep yourself open and clean. What I do, this is an awareness opener to let you know that this is what it's like to be free of these things. Uh, there are more out there. I can't take care of all of them or else we would have had the situation in hand, you know, decades, millennia ago. You know, um, there are environments inundated with these things. The People that you come into contact with, your friends, family, loved ones, uh, coworkers, employees, landlords, you know, you leases, whatever, people that you walk by on the street, you, they all have these entity attachments. The entire world is covered in this veil. It's covered in this scalar frequency that allows these things to swim through and find people. Your job is to recognize that once you're clean, you need to keep yourself clean. And the way you do that is you just keep the energy flowing. You keep it open. Um, so the Qigong moves that I teach – so I actually didn't plug this one yet. So my um, YouTube channel is Eric Pilgrim, and I have a few meditations on there. One of them is called the Extraction Protection Protocols. That's where I go through the energy work needed to shield yourself, and then I actually go through the steps to pull any type of dark energy out of your body. Um, so that's that right there is a really good spot for anybody trying to figure out how to do this to start right there. The other one that I actually think is more valuable, the more that I use this um, – and I thought this was just kind of a follow-up to the energy. Come to find out the prep work is much, much more important than the uh, the energy work to begin with. The energy work is the icing on the cake. The prep work gets rid of any type of anchor points or anything that these things can actually sink into. So the prep work, I go through EFT tapping, self-lymphatic drainage, Qigong, and conscious breathing. Uh, the conscious breathing is teaching you how to breathe chi and flow it in through your body. The chi kong right there is uh, – there's two moves that I teach, lifting the sky and chasing the moon. Lifting the sky, it actually buffers the central channel flow, and it makes you way, way stronger. Like I said, I was strong before. I was aware before. The chi kong blew the doors wide open for me. I highly recommend anybody and everybody do those. They are absolutely phenomenal movements. And the lifting the sky, it's a really, really simple one. It takes maybe about 10 seconds to get through the whole movement. Movement. You do that 10 times, you know, that's what, uh, 100, 100 seconds, that's almost two minutes right there. You know, two minutes of your time to do that, and then two minutes of your time to do the other one, that's less than five minutes, and that's more than enough to start opening these things up and keep them buffered and open and clean. Uh, getting to that point, you're probably going to have to work on it a lot more. You're probably going to have to flow the sensation through your body a bit, especially if I haven't worked on you beforehand because when I work on people, I remove everything, and we make sure that everything's nice and clean and flowing. When people are starting about this on their own, they have to work from the ground up, that base awareness level where I started, and have to move through finding like, oh, I can breathe into this area. Okay, all right, now that's not moving. That's stuck. How do we open that how do we move that but it is possible and so once you start doing this uh it, it's just a constant progression you know this is one of those things that it's not something that you can just say well i'm going to go get an extraction and have it and call it done uh this is a lifestyle choice this is a lifestyle change this is finding the internal darkness inside yourself your emotional uh, baggage, the skeletons in your closet, you know, this is pulling these out into the open, examining them, transmuting them into the light and allowing them to release out of your body. You know, this is transformation from the ground up. You can't say that there's a guarantee that you will never, ever be attacked again, because if I clean you out and then, you know, the next day you're uh, snorting cocaine off of, uh, you know, a hooker, <laughs> what are you going to do? Like, that's something that it's a personal choice. You have to take the responsibility off uh, from you and if your choices lead you down a dark path, you are going to come into contact with those resonances again. And I can't say here or there whether or not you're protected from that. Um, now, what I do in a, a session is I find the source. I find where things come from. I'm not happy and I'm not uh, satisfied with saying like there was something here and I pulled it off and that's done. No, I have to find out where that came from. That came there from something. An entity put that there. That didn't just magically appear. Something placed that there. I have to find the entities. I track down exactly where these things come from. And sometimes these go into false light systems. Sometimes these go into massive neurological network looking systems that uh, are the, like the loose lines, the factories that feed off of the planet that then send the the, uh, the food further up line. Uh, you'll tap into stuff like that. Sometimes these are even multidimensional and they go into multiple parallel realities. Uh, I find the source. I find where these come from, and I remove that. So if anything does come back, it's not going to be an entity that had years to practice 
uh, filtering un, uh, through your systems unaware. It's going to be something that is brand new to your field, and it's going to have to figure it out, yet you're going to have the awareness this time. You're going to understand what it's like to actually do this, and you're going to have the tools to remove these things and get them out of your field. You know, So it's it's all about your personal decision to make a dedication to this. And most of the time, once people are clear, they already are instinctively drawn to doing this anyway, just because it feels good and it feels right and it feels like home. It's natural. It's natural humanity. So once you get to that point to where you're clean, it's your job to keep yourself clean. So I can't take responsibility for that. You know, That's your job to take responsibility for. Our environment's inundated. It's up to you to make sure that when you feel the sludge that you clean it off. Yes, and uh, things like Tai Chi, Yoga, Aikido, they certainly help with that. But uh, since you yes, uh, mentioned that you uh, did martial arts, I think you said you did uh, karate. Um, don't mean to create any sort of a conflict here, but I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that the martial art I take, Aikido, is definitely the best martial art because you don't use violence to escalate violence in that martial art. And all the other martial arts you do, to some degree, utilize violence to escalate violence just for the hell of it. This is going to make for great radio conversation. Someone who took karate, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing maybe you might take a little offense to that statement. But um, <laughs> what do you have to say um, about my I, uh, philosophy in that regard? Okay, so I actually didn't go into any of the styles that I've taken. I've taken um, off the top of my head at least eight different styles, uh, from Kung Fu to Jiu Jitsu to Aikido to Krav Maga. I've done quite a bit of stuff, and I absolutely love Aikido. These are the Aikido principles are actually how I base my uh, my life. I am not. A, uh, uh, I'm a warrior. That's what I am. I am a, a person who stands up for justice. I am a person who stands up for what's right. And I will fight for those, for, you know, anybody who comes and infringes upon that. I have the right to self defense. But I will never, ever attack. I will never, ever throw the first punch. If you come to attack me, I will redirect your force back on yourself. So if you come at me trying to hurt me, I will redirect that back to you. If you come at me with lethal force, I will redirect that to you. I absolutely love the principles of Aikido. There is no escalation whatsoever. It is nothing more than a martial art of self-defense. You never escalate anything. It is always a response to what is thrown at you and you never ever follow it up afterwards. So if somebody, you know, they, they throw, uh, they come at you with a stick or something and you toss them over your head, you know, you incapacitated them. You're going to step back and you're going to wait for them to figure out, well, I just got tossed by this guy. Let's do that again. Okay. I got tossed again. Maybe I should stop doing this. Mm, let's give it one more shot. Well, here I am on the ground again. How about I just stop, you know? And so that I absolutely, absolutely love the Aikido principles. And yeah, you, you nailed it right on the head. There's a lot of people who uh, they'll say that their martial arts, the best martial art. I truly believe that if you believe your martial arts, the best martial art, then your martial art is the best martial art and it works the best for you. Aikido is something that I think works best for anybody who does not want to truly hurt somebody, but wants to know how to defend themselves. The principles that are learned inside of Aikido are absolutely, they're, they're light force principles. They are the, the, the military forces of the light forces use these principles. It's never escalate, never attack, always defend, always return the force with the same amount of force inflicted. I love Love it. Absolutely love Aikido. Yeah, although interesting, the uh, Jedi in Star Wars, they certainly wouldn't follow an Aikido philosophy the way they uh, flash their lightsabers and all that. What kind of martial art would they would they be utilizing if I if I asked you? What kind of martial art do Jedi appear to use based on their fighting style in the Star Wars movies? Any ideas on that one? Um, so in the the Star Wars Jedi's in the actual movies, they're theatrical. Um, they're they're more of like the um, the actual uh, you know like wires and fighter martial arts, like Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon types. It's all about the show. You know, you have to let people know. Uh, like uh, you have to give somebody a good visual for their story. You can't just have so like some of the most brutal, brutally efficient fighters in the world uh, don't make any flashy movements whatsoever. They are very methodical, deliberate, and it's the most um, efficient amount of force delivered in the smallest amount of effort. And it looks like hardly anything, like they're touching these people hardly whatsoever. So I would say that the ones in the movies are, you know, like they're the kung fu fighters on the um, on the wires. But like the actual Jedis, the people who are legitimately who use, quote unquote, the force, uh, they're, they're nothing like that. These guys are like they're the ultimate ninja shadows, you know, like you don't even know they're there until their job's already gone and uh, done and they're gone. You know, like they're um 
they, they're very highly efficient. They hide inside of reality and they bend reality around themselves to uh, just make sure that nobody even knows that they're there. Like, I mean, they could be standing right next to you and they could be completely and totally invisible. Like, I mean, you could walk through these people. They're, they're very, very real. They're very, very legitimate. And they are the ultimate Aikido uh, ninjutsu type users, I guess you could say. You know, they have the Aikido principles, but... Try finding one of these guys. Good luck. <laughs> They're harder to find than Bigfoot. <laughs> Hello? Andrew, are you there? Oh, sorry. I was on mute. Didn't realize it. Sorry. I'm right here. Okay. <laughs> so um, earlier you mentioned you did acknowledge you had some some drug problems with methamphetamine and I don't want to get into that story but what I do want to talk about is um, the idea that someone might think if I were to take LSD or mushrooms or something or some psychoactive substance before doing a, a healing I'm going to have a better chance of being successful in the healing while well, others would say you're out of your mind if you think that it, it works the exact opposite it's harder to do a, a genuine healing on yourself or someone else if you're not sober and even my paternal grandfather who um i was channeled by um some a couple of psychics uh, a couple years ago when i um was listening to him in the uh session i made the joke guys uh, is, is there anything i can do to better be able to to communicate with you and how you, you to communicate with me like should i go down to the pharmacy and uh drink a bottle of over-the-counter cough medicine or something and my grandfather said uh, no no don't don't do that or take any substance when you or you're higher on something it's actually harder for entities like me to to, to communicate with with you so it's easier when when humans are sober for us to to reach them so is the same true when it comes to uh, and also you, when the um uh would you have any problem heal harder time healing someone if they were uh high on a psychoactive substance relative to them being sober does that not make a difference and does, like i also said, wanted to ask does it matter if the healer on yourself or healing someone else is high on something does that make a difference um, so the biggest difference that I've actually noticed is pharmaceuticals. Uh, people who have like anti antidepressants or pain medicines in their body, uh, it's very, very hard to get things flowing. Like uh, natural substances uh, like uh, uh, marijuana or like mushrooms or uh, uh, mescaline or something along those lines, like peyote. Um, I've worked on people who had some of those uh, – like they weren't in the middle of the drug, but they had residuals on it. And even then, it was it was kind of weird the way the energy flowed, but it was nowhere near as stuck, nowhere near as blocked as the pharmaceutical medications were. Um, now, I have no problem talking about the methamphetamine use. Like that was a very, very dark point in time in my life that I was being led down, um, and I truly, truly appreciate those six months of my life because they showed me exactly who I never, ever want to be. I lost myself into that drug. I truly lost myself, and I didn't come back until I looked in the mirror when I was – 22 years old and I saw like a, a literally a, a 40 year old corpse looking back at me and I mean that was just the biggest eye-opening experience of my life and recognizing how I had literally given away my power to something that was not me and um, it was it was a very very powerful powerful thing to go through looking back on it it was awful at the time it was horrible like I mean I've gone through a lot of really awful stuff that I look back at it now because I've been able to release the trauma energy and actually process it, learn from it, and grow from it, that I can look back on it. And it was a good thing that I went through just because I have been able to change the uh, the past and the energy around it. But at the time, it was awful. It was absolutely horrible, you know, and like the energy that I was being opened up to when I was in the midst of this was uh, very, very dark. I could see these things like as clearly as I do right now, but I had no clue what they were. You know, you hear about it all the time with people on meth, the shadow people, you know, the uh, uh, stuff like that. And so I was seeing these things very, very clearly, but there wasn't anything I could do about it. And I was in a heightened fight or flight state constantly and, you know, sleep deprived on top of it to boot, you know. And so it's uh, like people who use pharmaceuticals, like anything that's been through a lab, anything that's chemicalized like methamphetamine, pharmaceutical drugs, uh, cocaine, heroin, you know, stuff like that. Anything that's been through a chemical process, there's something that happens to it energetically that uh, it slows down energetic processes that are organic inside the body. Um, now, stuff like marijuana, uh, uh, like DMT, ayahuasca, stuff like that, it is more along the lines of a teaching tool. I, I don't 
believe that it's okay to constantly use and abuse things. I think if you are going to be using stuff like that, that you need to be doing it with uh, moderation and understanding of what you are actually going into it for because it's a tool that as soon as you let it out of your grasp, it becomes something that is nothing more than abuse and it's detrimental to your spiritual growth. So, you know, like you were talking about yourself going through the ayahuasca retreat, you know, that's a thing I think a lot of people should think about doing because not only does that change the brain chemistry of your body to actually allow you to open yourself to these chemical processes, it jumpstarts production of your own DMT. And when you start producing your own DMT, you can go on some of the most intense psychedelic journeys that you've ever been on in your life through the astral and like full body dives of immersion that you come back out of and you're just like, oh my God, did I really just, wow, that was, that was natural? Like, are you kidding me? Like, okay, that, that's very interesting right there because we have a lot of different receptors in our body that are open to these types of chemicals and compounds because we are designed to create them. We are designed to create some resonance of these types of uh, compounds and uh, protein and chemical chains inside of these plants and uh, internally inside of ourselves. And so, you know, that's why we have like cannabinoid receptors and that's why we produce the MT. You know, it's things along those lines that you have to start like looking at what really truly is for what it is. The fact that we produce DMT, the fact that we have um, NNDMT, the, uh, the psilocybin um, uh, mushroom uh, receptors for those that fit right in with our DMT, the fact that we have um, you know, the, the uh, peyote, the mescaline, it fits right in side with like the so serotonin receptors. You know, you have to look at these things and recognize that there is a reason for that out there. And the, the fact that we've been cut off multidimensionally uh, does not mean that that multidimensionally is not still out there and we're not connected to it. We just don't recognize it. And so when we come into contact with these physical atomic structures or these forms of energy that are holding so pretty much the atomic structure is just a form that is holding a specific resonance. And so when these come into contact with our bodies and our bloodstreams, they do allow us to open up to a frequency that we are supposed to be able to naturally be there. Uh, that being said, it's not okay to abuse things. These are, these are medicinal. These are, uh, they're journeys. They're shamanic. These are something that you should always treat with reverence. This is not a party type thing. You know, it's something that needs to be held with utmost respect and it shouldn't be done more than two or three times a year. It's something that's for growth, for learning, and you need to do the work on your own in the meantime as well. It's something that you use. You do the work internally and you use it to show the next level of what needs to be taken care of. Did I cover everything? Right, right. But in regards to if, if you're high on something um, and trying to heal someone or someone's trying to heal themselves and they're high on a drug, um, is it be like not going to be as, effect as good a healing than it probably will be had they done it while sober? Um, like I said, anything pharmaceutical, anything chemical, it slows down the flow of energy ridiculously. It's, it's, it's like pushing clay through uh, water hoses. It's very sluggish. It's very tight. It's hard to do. It can be done, though. Will it be as effective? No. Um, I haven't really found anything with, like, natural substances. Like I said, I've worked on people. Like, LSD is the only thing that I haven't actually worked on, uh, worked on somebody who was under the influence of yet. I'm sure I will come into contact with somebody who is wanting me to do that sometime in the future. I come into all kinds of really interesting people. But, um, it's one of these things that it doesn't change the way that the body responds to the energy. It changes the way that the energy flows inside of the body. And so that there is a different quality to their flow of energy, but the work is still there. The blockages that are there of are of the same resonance. So it doesn't matter if they're changing their vibration around it. I'm still going after those resonances that are blocking the flow. The pharmaceuticals are the only ones that I ever have a problem with because I can remove the blockages, but things just don't start moving afterwards. Like especially people who've been on like say um, Prozac for you know the past 15, 20 years, something like that. That's a really, really hard one to get moving. There's a lot of detoxification that has to happen inside the body to even start hooking that back up together um but it is possible oh okay but but you mentioned clicks that you assert there is definitely uh um problems with synthetic versus natural substances now that brings up an interesting question um because you know um psilocybin mushrooms and dmt they're natural but they can in theory be produced uh 
is synthetically LSD that um, is, it's synthetic. You got to tweak it in the lab, but at its it is a natural substance at a core. It's in a sense because it's mm -hmm. from a fungus that grows on rye. And um, there are um, like ayahuasca, even though it's natural, you can make what they call pharmacahuasca with synthetic DMT and an MAOI, not from the vine, but some pharmaceutical MAOI. Uh, although I'm sure any shaman would tell you there is no way it's going to be as effective as natural ayahuasca. And um, like I joked with my paternal grandfather on the side about a drinking cough medicine to try to meet him. There are a lot of people who would assert that even though it's synthetic, cough medicine is great for spirit spiritual enlightenment there was this website that doesn't exist anymore called dxm zine where people had all sorts of crazy spiritual stories about um about their experiences on that and some of them even asserted that um well a lot of them even mentioned that william white there's a thing on the internet called the dxm faq this guy william white made during the clinton administration that he spent uh, several thousand hours researching the pharmacology of that stuff so all the people that posted on that site they apparently did their research so they're not stupid even though they trip on something that's 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 pharmaceutical but um you assert that well yeah but it's not the same even if the uh, people in the lab hypothetically were that were making these synthetic drugs um were to try to put their best love into the drugs and and like bless the drugs and say i hope that all the people that that take these drugs that I'm making in the lab, I want them to make sure that they get the highest good from it. Well, if they do that and put their intent to that, I'm sure it wouldn't cause as many bad side effects the drug would because it was blessed by the people that made it in the lab. But you, but you say it's still going to cause problems in regards to like energy flow. So, um, do you really, really shy away from the use of synthetic drugs like pharmacowasca and? and synthetic mushrooms and um, cough medicine and such, uh, people that assert that those things can be used for spiritual enlightenment, you think it's not worth it? Oh, I'm not saying that it's not worth it. I mean, I'm saying that – so DXM, I actually have experimented that when I was younger, and I had some really, really incredibly profound spiritual experiences on it. It was uh, quite amazing, actually. I was seeing sound and hearing color. I could you know, shoot the sound and sound waves and amplify it, and I could make the sound actually uh, – show up in different rooms and people would hear me in different rooms because I was manipulating it. And I had no clue what I was doing. I was really, really, you know, back in the party days. And uh, like I ended up falling asleep and I went through multiple hearts of elements. Um, like I fell into the heart of water. I slipped into the heart of fire, uh, the heart of earth, uh, you know, and, and so on and so forth, all the way to the heart of spirit. And it was very interesting and a very profound experience for me. So I'm not saying that it isn't a legitimate thing. It is a very legitimate thing. Like it, some of the stories that you hear about people on LSD uh, coming back with new awarenesses from their understandings that are on, on that, just because it is a synthetic compound, does that make that relevation? or revelation or that understanding less significant? No, not at all. I mean, that's like uh, you got to take the message for instead of the messenger. It doesn't matter how you get the message as long as you pay attention to it. Like, I mean, if I tripped and stubbed my toe over a rock inside of a field that immediately started telling me the secret of life, would I stop and say, nope, you're a rock. You can't talk. La, 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 la. No, I'd listen to this rock even though they can't talk. You know, I don't care about the messenger. I want the message. And so that's what that's all about right there. I'm saying that my work on this side, it looks like the energy is off. And it's only for stuff like um, that when it gets really, really stuck, it's heavy antidepressants and pain medicines. Pain medicines cut you off from actually flowing back to the body. It's not just cutting off the pain flow to you. It's cutting off your connection to the body backwards. And so like when that's cut off like that, everything gets really, really sluggish. I'm not saying that it's not effective. I'm saying that it does different things to the body and it's not as effective. Just because you are using something synthetic does not mean that your revelations are any less profound. Um, you know, take for instance, uh, what was that movie? Um, v for Vendetta, you know, when he had her in the, uh, the cage and she, he was telling her, listen, you have to give up V or else you're going to die. And she decided, fine, take me out to the shed. I'm ready to die. You know, it just because it was uh, all fabricated, just because it was not real, she was ready to go at that point in time. She had come to, to peace with her death. And just because it was not a real situation does not make that feeling any less real for her. And just because it's something synthetic does not make that revelation any less powerful or any less um enlightening it's just that there's a factor that comes with the body itself there is a bit of physical 
uh, damage that comes with these things. And even with the natural stuff, too, don't get me wrong. Natural stuff isn't just because it's natural. It isn't completely and totally healthy for you. I mean, peyote, that does some really, really messed up stuff to the body, messed up stuff to the brain just to get you into that frequency there. And so, you know, whoa, whoa, whoa. I've got to stop you right there because I took a peyote ceremony first day of spring in, uh, in 2016 down at Arizona at the Peyote Way Church. I didn't have any mm-hmm. problems from that. I thought it was somewhat um, enlightening doing it by a fire uh, um, on the first day of spring uh, in during the exact time of the, the oh, that's equinox, beautiful. By the way, yeah. So, um, what what exactly are you talking about? Are you uh, you seem to be saying we shouldn't be going down oh, no, those I'm... ceremonies? I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that you need to just be aware. You need to see how things work inside your body and just be careful with it. You know, you need to pay attention to what happens internally because peyote, what that does energetically, it's one of the the craziest things I've ever seen is it like supercharges the energetic centers of the body and then it shoots everything up into the head and then the entire crown opens up and it's almost like a blossoming lotus that connects into, I mean, multidimensionality. And so, I mean, it's giving a multidimensional awareness and function to the uh, the physical body itself. And that expansion, if you're not ready for something like that, if you don't have enough fluidity, if you're too rigid, it can break you. You know, it can, uh, you got to be fluid. You got to be flowing like water, you know, stuff like this. They, they were talking about it in the 60s when they started using like the Tibetan Book of the Dead as like a guideway through getting through uh, like intense bad trips and stuff like that. You know, it's, it's all about relaxing and letting the flow happen and not standing up to it and trying to stand in the way and just, you know, bending backwards and letting it flow. And so if you aren't ready energetically, if you aren't ready mentally for stuff like this, this is something that you should be preparing for. This isn't something that you should do on just like a whim. You've obviously done a lot of work. You can jump into an ayahuasca ceremony or you can jump into a peyote ceremony and say, look, I know who I am. I'm just going to go for the journey. I already know that I've faced my fears. I've seen everything inside of myself. I understand what's happening. I understand what I could be shown. I'm going to go for a much more enlightening experience because once you start getting to the point where you've cleaned out all your shadows, you know, that's what this stuff brings up. That's what this shows you that you need to focus on, that you need to clean out. And so don't get me wrong. I don't want anybody to think that I'm saying don't do plant medicine. Uh, I'm saying be moderate with it. Be careful with it. Use it as a ceremony. This isn't something that you should uh, handle as, you know, I'm just going to go see what these sensations are and have fun with it. This is something that you should go into saying I have a specific goal for this. There is a work that needs to be done. Show me what needs to come up. And, you know, that's what the, the kind of energy that you need to go in there with it. And so, you know, I'm not saying that it's a, um, a detrimental thing to do to the body. I'm just saying that you need to have the fluidity. You need to have the ability to expand your consciousness and encompass where you're going because somebody who's in a very base 3D reality, if you throw them into an ayahuasca trip all of a sudden, it's going to scare the living crap out of them. You know, they don't have anywhere to understand that type of a, uh, a reality because it's so far multidimensional outside of their perspective that it's a lot, it's a heck of a stretch to get there. Some people can do it, a lot can't, you know, it's something that you have to be understanding of and just practice with it. And then when you get to the point to where, um, like you got to abusing mushrooms like I was, I was eating mushrooms quite a bit and, uh, it got to the point to where it wasn't an enlightening experience anymore. It was, uh, it was a drug. It was feeding an addiction. I wanted to feel that way, you know? And so it's, you, you have to recognize where the balance is because these things are here for a, a gateway into a multidimensional consciousness and understanding. And, uh, but they, they, ha- they do have pitfalls. There are things that you need to watch out for. So, I mean, it's, um, it's just finding the balance. It's understanding that this has a very, very high potential for good, and it's got a potential for something that's not so good. And just recognizing that as you follow down the middle, that you take from it what you need. It might show you something that you might consider not so good, you know, but it's uh, bringing up what needs to be worked on. So yeah, don't don't get it. Don't ever get me wrong. There are very, very legitimate uh, uses for everything, even the pharmaceuticals. I mean, take for instance the uh, the pain medicine. You know, if you've got a pain so bad to the point that it is distracting you from everything that you're doing and you cannot function, you need something to take that pain and inflammation level down. Don't get me wrong. There are definitely definitely uses for all of these things. It's just the constant habitual use of everything. Anything and everything, all the way from the chemical to the pharmaceutical to the natural to, you know, the the synthetic, you know, everything. It's all in moderation and recognizing that your body has the ability to do most of this stuff anyway. These aren't things that you need to get to that point. These are things that you need to 
reminds you that you can do that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yes, it does make sense. And uh, switching gears now, uh, meditation, uh, another way to get high without taking the drugs, meditate, um, different styles of meditating. And once again, I'm going to pick on George Cavazos. Love to pick on him for the chakras. I admire the guy greatly with some of the things he says. He's like, well, more power to you that you can do this. But most, most people wouldn't want to go this way because it seems so lack of variety and spirituality loves variety. He uh, talks about whenever you meditate, it's always in your best interest to radiate love. I mean, your infinite consciousness, what, what, what you, any meditation in which you don't radiate love with the intent of spreading love to some other place or location service to others rather than service to self style is the best way to go i mean great i'm not going to argue with that but <laughs> there, there's many different types of meditations and i think a little variety keeps jack from becoming a dull boy um although there's other debates as to uh, how you should and should not meditate um of course the simple answer is well believe whatever you believe don't ask other people to give you answers well Yes, but there are reasons why certain like meditation guides would would assert that this is the way they suggest is the best way to do it. And uh, one good example of this, um, this meditation that I like maybe attended a every other week basis um, or in the uh, nature reserve that's near my place. This guy does a 20 minute meditation every um, Saturday from 10 to 10, 20 a.m. And uh, he, for the new people that show up, everybody always reads like the instructions for best way to meditate according to like whatever, whatever guide he got that from. And uh, one of the things it says is if you feel an itch, don't scratch. You may be tempted to, you may think get it, scratching to get rid of the itch is going to make the meditation better. But in reality, the itch is a sign of energy flow to that to that area so it's kind of a blessing don't get away the blessing by interrupting your meditation with by scratching yourself I, I mean um when it comes to meditations being better than the other and of course this quite this question to itch or not to scratch or not to scratch while meditating do you have any chance of any um comment on on whether that's a good a thing to do to make the most of your meditations or ruin them <laughs> <laughs> don't scratch your itches huh that sounds awful yeah. um so yeah if i have an itch comes up that comes up in meditation i scratch it there i don't feel any energy flow to that area i find it a huge huge distraction that is keeping me from uh finding my center point if i get into the zero point and i'm in there and i feel an itch kind of bounce on the outside of that I'll ignore that, you know, but I have to get to that point beforehand. But, I mean, there's all kinds of different meditations that you could do. Like, I mean, sending love out to everything, that's a very service to others uh, style of approach. But if you don't have enough energy inside yourself, if you don't have enough love inside yourself to take care of yourself, then you don't have anything to send to the world. So taking care of yourself is a service to others type of a uh um, opportunity as well. You know, you have to take care of yourself. Self care is one of the most important things that you can do in order to help take care of other people. You know, that's one of the things that I run into the most is that a lot of our, uh, energetic healing community, people get burnt out. They don't ever, you know, take care of themselves. They're always go, 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 go. And so you have to take time that's scheduled out for you to rest, to relax, to exercise, to move around, to, you know, sit and watch TV if that's what you feel guided to do that day. You know, you need to take time out for yourself. And a lot of my meditations are uh, going internally and making sure that my body is nice and healthy and nice and clean. That way I can continue to do the work that I'm doing for other people. Um, one of the easiest ones that I absolutely love to do, uh, I got this from, uh, it's an ancient, ancient Chinese translation and it's actually, they call it the, um, the golden furnace of purification. And so just sitting in a normal lotus position, you don't like have to, you know, get your legs all crazy and like cocked up. You just crisscross, crisscross applesauce, like my kids call it. And you just sit there and you just breathe with the conscious breath. You take the blood flow, take the energy flow, and you take it right down into the pelvis. And once that feels nice, bright, and hot, you start inhaling up the spine with this golden pearl of energy. And you hold it up at the top of the breath, almost like a quantum pause. So it's an inhale pause and then you he keep it here in the brain and then on the exhale you breathe it down the front of the body and then you pause again inside the pelvis with this golden pearl and what you do is like they actually say that this is a meditation for sainthood right here if you can make 300 rotations completely and totally up the down up the spine and down the front 
uh, with no distraction and complete and total focus that you can transcend the physical level and actually break through to the other side. I always end up running into so much energetic uh, awareness that pops up out of this meditation. The most rotations I've ever even been able to get to was 50 before I had to go move on to something else because it was so glaringly obvious to me. Um, so this is a really powerful meditation that opens up flow inside the body. It connects anything that's blocked. It opens up uh, the, the nervous system. It opens up the organ system. It cleans out anything that's blocked, stagnant, shut down, and it opens up flow to keep you nice, young, healthy, and rejuvenated. Um, other things that I like to do is I'll connect into source, and I'll bring that down through my body, and then I'll connect into the planet, and then I'll radiate through me uh, a field that surrounds the entire planet, and then I'll just send my utmost love, you know, like the, the feeling that I have when I'm holding my kids, you know, when they're little babies and that just that overwhelming, just exuberance and like, this is my baby, you know, and I send that out to the world. So, I mean, there's multiple things that you can do, but you have to make sure that you have quote variety because all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. If you itch, scratch, you know, keep comfortable. If you need to um, hang upside down on an inversion table to get comfortable enough to meditate, do it. You know, like if that's what you need to do in order to meditate, do it. If you need to lay down uh, with a pillow underneath your feet and your head twisted to the left side while you're holding on your to your right nostril with your left hand, do it. You know, it doesn't matter what you need to do to get to that comfort level. If you're if you're itching, scratch it for Christ's sake. I mean, that's going to bug you just absolutely batty sitting there and trying to let this energy of this these nerves sitting there bugging you, you know, trying to let them dissipate. No, don't do that. Let yourself just be comfortable and just Allow things to flow. Don't hold yourself to such a high standard. Allow things to just relax and work the way that they're supposed to. You know, go into a meditation and say, hey, this is my intention. This is what I'm going to try to do. If you get led off into another direction, follow that. You know, these things aren't set into concrete. These are constantly shifting and malleable. It's just like the energy coming into the planet. It's always changing. So just do stuff different. Do stuff that feels right. You know, just follow it along as it goes. Yes, that that is decent advice right there. And uh, now I'd like to talk about um, diet for a little bit um, when it comes to whether or not humans should be herbivores and not omnivores. This is a debate that um, never stops. I mean, some of the people in the science community assert that our digestive system is more like that of a bear or pigs and bears and pigs are omnivores. So it stands to reason that um, our digestive system resembles theirs more than it does apes, as a matter of fact, then um, you would think, okay, that means we should be acting like omnivores, although all the people out there who are, um, not all the people, but many of the people in the spirituality community who are strictly um, vegetarian or vegan, for that matter, uh, will say that um, if you keep eating meat, you will uh, not be able to fully resolve karma. And um, I'm thinking when I'm hearing all this, okay, then naturally you would think if uh, if eating meat is bad, if it is bad, then um, it's not in our best interest when it comes to wanting to heal ourselves or um, other people like you healing us if like the healer is a meat eater or the person being healed is a um, meat eater either way. So uh, one would think, okay, if everybody was a vegetarian, it would be a lot easier for people like you to, to do your healing jobs and people for, for us to to heal ourselves, but there are those who say, well, that's kind of ridiculous. If eating meat makes you happy and satisfied, then you're going to have a better time uh, doing the healing. Well, maybe that's an illusion. Maybe um, you've shut down your energy channels by eating meat, and even though you get a little bit of a food high from eating it and feel better, that doesn't mean you've made the energy channels any better. So the debate over whether to eat meat or not and how it would tie into your work and healing, anything to say about that? Oh, I'm really glad you asked that, actually. Um, this is something that I've had to deal with myself because I tried to go vegetarian for a while, and I can't do it. My body type just doesn't allow it. I have to eat meat, otherwise I start getting very sick and uh, I lose weight. Like I'm, a, I'm not a big guy. I'm 155 pounds, 5'6", and the last time I tried to go vegetarian, I ended up down to 115 pounds. I mean, no, I, I'm, I've, I've got a, a decent amount of muscle on me, but – me losing that much weight, I mean, that was almost a third of my body weight, and I was just absolutely wrecked. My health, it just got shot, and I cannot uh, exist without some type of animal protein. And there's a bunch of people out there who have the same type of uh, metabolism I do. You know, genetically, I come from a bunch of potato farmers and, and beef farmers, you know, <laughs> like that, that's, that's where I came from, and so that's genetically what I need. Um, I personally am 
a bit more aversion to eating as much meat as a lot of people do. I try to keep more towards like fish and chicken, but I do eat steak every once in a while. It's just that I can't eat as much of it. My body, the more I go through this process of uh, opening up the blockages and everything and letting it all go, my body's just less tolerant of anything that's low vibrational. So I can't eat any type of processed food, any type of uh, pesticides, any, um, you know, like gluten, GMO stuff. I can't eat it. It literally causes uh, severe pain inside my body. And so I have to keep everything just about as uh, healthy and natural as possible. Um, one of the things that people are actually feeling when they eat meat and then feel these, uh, like, say that you can't ever resolve karma or anything like that, and then feeling the negative connotation from the meat is actually these factory farms. These factory farms are absolutely horrific. It is torture on the highest level, and it's not just humans that um, these uh, these entities are feeding off of. It's animals, too, and there's systematic factory slaughterhouses that are torture chambers for these things, you know, and like they're living their entire lives up to their ankles and feces, you know, they've got festering sores and they're just terrified their whole entire lives. They've never ran in the grass. They don't know what it's like to actually be free. And this is what we're putting into our bodies when we eat this food right here. Uh, all of my stuff's organic. I've got, uh, you know, my chickens, they lay healthy, happy eggs, you know, they're healthy, happy chickens. They eat the bugs out in the backyard, you know, they're, they're good to go. You know, they, um, the the food that I eat, it has to be clean. It can't be uh, something that has that negative energy on it, which brings me back to another point. Um, you can clean out the energy of your food. You don't have to leave that dark energy in your food. This, uh, you know, like you look back at, uh, they tell us, you know, you have to pray over your food. You have to bless your food. Well, this is one of the reasons why. What you can do is visualize this food on your plate, almost like a, a dull mass of just it's, it's matter. That's what it is. And what you can do is you can inject it with the golden frequency, with the love, with the vibrancy, and you can turn it into a mass of golden food on your plate, golden energy that's very, very vi bright, very vibrant. So I don't put any food or water into my body that I haven't already transmuted beforehand because there's a lot of stuff out in our environment that I just I, – I, my body doesn't – process. It can't do it anymore. It's too low vibrational for the high vibrational state that I'm actually coming into. And so my body rejects it violently. And so it's just one of those things that um, – Especially with the, the carnivore and the vegan thing, you know, you have to follow what feels right for your body. If you feel like one way of eating is good for you, like if you can go vegetarian, I highly recommend it. There are so many people out there who uh, once they get into a vegetarian diet, they feel better than they ever have in their lives. But more often than not, not their genetics come from, say, like an Asian or an Indian or a Mediterranean background. Um, you know, and, and when we look at like, uh, more Caucasian people, you know, people from Europe, stuff like that were descended from, um, much more of a, a meat eating stock, you know, that's kind of how that all was progressed over the years. And I mean, I'm not saying that we can't train ourselves out of it. I haven't found the way how to do it yet. I'm looking into more Ayurvedic eating because eventually I do want to get off of meat only if I have enough way, uh, enough protein and enough nutrients and minerals and a way to sustain myself. Personally, I want to get off of food entirely. I want to be able to photosynthesize. I want to be able to go stand in the sun and soak up my food for the day and then not have to eat whatsoever. I don't want to have to go to the bathroom. I don't want to have to do any of that. And that's my goal. That's what I'm working towards. And uh, that's one of the things that I'm actually working with with sun gazing, um, which it's probably a bad idea to move to the Pacific Northwest if I want to sun gaze. But hey, what can you do there? But, um, you know, with the, the whole meat eating thing, it's you got to follow the vibration of your body. And we've got indigenous cultures around the planet who not only do they eat meat, they uh, they have a very, very in-depth responsible role in hunting, cleaning, gathering their food. And so they are eating something that not only is was alive and sentient, they were the ones that hunted it and killed it and cleaned it out and then brought it home for their family to eat. And these people are connected in on a spiritual level that's way deeper than most of us in our Western society can even get close to. And so how can we say that they are, you know, less spiritual than us when we're eating nothing but, you know, rabbit food over here, <laughs> you know? It's, it's all about the perspective and it's understanding that results are what matter. And so for some people, they experience amazing results when they go to vegetarianism. And I honestly wish that I did too. I just don't. Um, and so I have to respect my body. My body, it will literally reject everything. It will start to, 
um, crumble on me if I don't have animal fats and proteins. And that's only just because I haven't figured out how to synthesize everything on my own. I haven't been able to figure out how to make my own internal food because I think that's the direction that we're heading with natural humanity is that eventually we won't need stuff like this. We can uh, look at it as a thing of the past. You know, the needing to eat is um, – something that we can look at as uh, an, an old habit. You know, We can look at using the organs and the meridian flow for something other than digestion and actually moving on towards a higher state of being there. And so that's what I'm headed towards. So, I think I'm hopefully heading towards that too. I mean, when it comes to not eating meat, um, you can – that graph, I think it's called a hyperbola in which it uh, goes down, down closer and closer to zero but never actually reaches zero. That's kind of what I expect my meat eating habits to do, go down yeah. and down but never reach zero at some point, although I'm working on these things like the only meat I eat now is uh, – the only place I shop is Whole Foods. I don't always buy organic because of the price factor, but I make sure to always shop at Whole Foods regardless, so I know I'm getting high-quality stuff there. And um, the only meat I eat now basically is um, chicken and turkey whenever it's available during the holiday season and the pepperoni that uh, they put on my pizza whenever I go to the local restaurant for buy one, get one free pizza on monday so i'm working on it and when it comes to um uh, uh other things that we can eat um to maybe as a stepping stone to getting towards vegetarianism and also um maybe do other good things for our body uh, eating edible weeds like dandelions and clovers uh this saturday i'm going to be attending something at the local nature reserve i'm um, called wild edibles where there's also going to be one in the summer for all the plants that grow in the summer time and maybe even one in the fall too um where they talk about besides dandelions and clovers, what other um, springtime in this this session is going to be at a, wild weeds can be eaten, and um, I'm going to go to that and hopefully uh, take advantage of it. So uh, now Santos Bonacci, he's really big on eating flowers. Um, a lot of people think he's a lunatic now because of the whole flat Earth poster boy thing that he's turned himself into. But um, regardless, there's some things he talks about that are pretty enlightening, and one of the things I'm glad I listened to him talk about was. In eating flowers, even I think he's even asserted it would activate your crown chakra, which kind of makes sense if you think about a flower as sort of a, a crown at the top of the chakra system. It kind of does look like that. So, um, um, eating wild flowers like uh, well, clover is really only good for survival, um, they say. So you really want it, don't really need to eat those. But a dandelion is really good, and some other wild uh, weeds. Do you uh, think eating them is a good idea? Oh, definitely. I can't stress enough how amazing dandelion root is. If you have any liver issues whatsoever, the whole entire plant it can be eaten. The flower, the stalk, the roots, the leaves, everything. And it's amazing for cleaning out the liver. A dandelion tea is um, – it's one of those things that it won't taste anywhere near as good as uh, you would hope, but it is very, very powerful for cleansing the body. Clovers as well, yeah. Uh, any type of collating substance uh, – uh, collating, chelating, I don't know how to pronounce that. I've only read it. But um, what that does is that actually binds onto uh, undesirable uh, particles in the body such as heavy metals or you know um, uh, minerals or calcium deposits that are just free-floating, and then it excretes them out of the body. And so anything along those lines, yeah, definitely. Um, there's one weed in particular. I can't remember the name of it for the life of me right now, but it grows uh, very heavily in California, and I remember seeing it everywhere. But it's got a really thick, fleshy stalk and more like uh, small, round leaves on it. And uh, I always thought this thing was a weed. I'd pull it up out of the lawn and I'd throw it away. Come to find out, it's one of the most nutritional uh, substances on the planet. It's like one of like we look at uh, avocados and like you know chia seeds and like hemp seeds as a superfood. This puts all of that to shame. It's absolutely amazing, and it grows in everybody's lawn. I mean, like this stuff, like the, our medicines are literally growing out inside of our manicured lawns, and we pull them out and throw them away and call them weeds. Yeah, I definitely want to look into that a little bit more. Um, use the uh, leaves and the flowers that you can eat outside as weeds. Don't throw them away or put the weed killer on them until you eat them first. So, um, all right, uh, just so you know, over the sake of time, we got um, a little less, than, little less than 20 minutes to go before we'll call it a night. So I guess switching gears now, let's go to um, some of these articles you've written. Uh, maybe you can give a nice abridged version of everything you wrote in the the article here, the virus of consciousness. Now, why would you equate uh, put put virus and consciousness as the two main words in the same title? Everybody thinks of like consciousness as sort of um, a good thing. Well, in terms of being uh, trying to expand your consciousness, but you're, you, this, looking at this, are you suggesting that expanding consciousness is kind of a bad thing? Because uh, everybody thinks of viruses as being um, bad a lot, of, a lot of people debate whether or not viruses are alive i say they're not but anyhow that's beside the point um 
you, you seem to suggest their ki- uh, their consciousness has bad qualities because you can equate it with viruses, sort of. But, but maybe I'm taking this the wrong way. What is this article really about? Oh, yeah, you're, you're definitely taking that the wrong way. It's the virus of consciousness. It's the virus infecting consciousness, and that's what the parasitic construct is, and that's kind of an overview on all of that right there and why it's there, what it's doing, and what you can actually do about it. Okay, thank you. Um, right. And etheric implants and entities are human nature with human nature in quotation marks. Now, this is a term. Some people hate uh, this term. Mark Passio, for example, he says he hates it when people say uh, this is human nature because um, that he sees that as a justification for uh, – uh, for for doing something, and when it comes to human actions, that you, there's no, you shouldn't be in, into the justification of it. It should be more into the to the reason behind it. And um, well, I, not not that he would say that. I'm just elaborating what some would assert in regards to why they would uh, hate people using the term human nature. But um, anyhow, there are those like I said in the camp that. Um, say it's not a term we should use because it makes sense as something that's totally entirely phony as a as a justification for certain behaviors behaviors that are not necessarily good so um exactly which, well, yeah which makes sense here because we're talking about etheric implants and entities which is not necessarily good so mm-hmm. um, explain um what this three part and i see part 3a i'm guessing there's more coming so uh, um yes yeah, so <laughs> we'll why don't you uh, also tell us uh get us in store without a spoiler alert maybe just a brief thing on what's in store for the future of this article Okay, so um, etheric implants and entities are human nature. Uh, that's the, the, the title of the article with human nature in quotations because human nature is what we call the greed, the avarice, the jealousy, the warlike mentality that is human nature. You know, that's what we call it. You know, it's, it's – well, it's just human nature that everybody's jealous of everybody. It's just human nature that we're all greedy, you know, quote unquote. No, that's not the case. Human nature – in a natural state is very benevolent, very kind, very loving, and very generous. What we're looking at right now is that what we call human nature is nothing more than the reptilian brain, the uh, injected overview consciousness on top of our own consciousness that makes us think that we are thinking our own thoughts and feeling our own feel- our, our own feelings. Like these uh, devices inside the body, they inject emotions, they inject thought forms, they inject, you know, um, uh, they, they'll talk in your own voice inside your head. And, you know, this is the stuff that's constantly running 24-7 over and over and over again. And so what it's doing is it's literally training neurological pathways through neurolinguistic programs into these habits and pathways. So that's why we get these knee-jerk reaction- reactive behaviors. Uh, that's why we end up with the, the greed the avarice, the hatred, the jealousy, you know, whatever we call human nature, it's not human nature. It's an energetic blueprint that was overlaid on top of our energetic blueprint and forced us to bend into that. Once you start removing these blockages that keep you out of that, real human nature comes forward. And human nature is completely and totally open. There is no hiding. There is no claiming this is mine. This is ours. That's why this information's free on my website. It's not our information. If you want me to do a healing for you, Go ahead, uh, book a session. That's it. That's all there is to it. You don't need me to do this because all the information is already out there. Everything that I know, everything that I teach, it's already there for you guys to look at it. So you don't even need me because this isn't my information. I just tapped into a frequency that allowed me to be able to decode this, to understand it, to recognize it, and more importantly, to share it. So, you know, that's uh, that's why those are in quotations right there. Um, and in the first part of that article, um, part one, I go through how the system actually works, what the what fields they use, the scalar waves, the frequencies uh, and pretty much how everything works and how the symptoms line up and what all happens in the body that leads to this. In the second one, I actually go through different components of the system, uh, the false light construct, the, uh, the false darkness construct. Um, AI, artificial intelligence, the organic construct, and I start going into actual uh, devices that can be found inside the auric field in the body itself. In 3A, I start going into devices that can be found in the body and how to remove these. So every single thing that I talk about, every single thing that I teach inside the article, there's a solution for it, what you can do about it, and then how to reconnect that flow back inside of you. So this isn't um, I, I have to step out of the, the the whole fear porn agenda because like this is kind of scary stuff that we're talking about. You know, this is a multidimensional consciousness that is inflicting its will onto humanity. That's it's kind of scary, you know. But <laughs> that's not what this is about. This is recognizing how amazing we are. They're here because they need our fuel. They need our energy to power themselves. Without us, they're nothing. 
we are literally running the whole shebang and we need to take our power back so that we can end this. I don't want to be here in this matrix mentality anymore. I want this world to be open, to be free, to be, you know, people who have uh, complete and total access to food, water, and shelter is a right of existence instead of something that we all have to pay for. I want to eliminate this Babylonian slave money magic. I want to go back to direct energetic exchange. You know, if we need a currency or uh, something that's a, um, a byproduct or like a, a quick, you know, exchange, we can do something like that, but like a, a cryptocurrency, like a Bitcoin, you know, something that it can't be manipulated, you know, something along those lines. You know, this is what we need to step into with humanity right here. And so this is why I'm giving out all this information. Because there has to be a solution. There can't just be somebody yelling about all this crazy stuff. You know, I'm, I, I can't be the guy on the corner of the road with the sign about the world's ending and then giving nobody tools to actually help about it. You know, it's all well and good if I could see it ending. If I'm just sitting there doing nothing but yelling about it, what's the point? You know, we have to have a solution for this. We have to have a no nonsense approach. These are scary things that we're probably going to be seeing. That's fine. They're only scary because they need you to be scared. That's it. Right, and if you want to step away from the fear porn, that's your prerogative, although um, I do give people like Alex Jones a lot of credit for uh, scaring oh, a lot of people to um, give them a nice kick in the pants, which humanity needs. They could perhaps focus on solutions a little bit more, and maybe they are a little obsessed with the publicity that they get from from um, fear porn, but nonetheless, they give humanity a nice kick in the pants, So, and, and, and their intention is to put a stop to the uh, powers that be's agenda, so as long as that is their intent they are definitely not giving any power to the powers that be by exposing them and offering solutions to them so um with that being said uh next i want to talk about sun gazing you mentioned you do it i am a very avid sun gazer i get a lot of i got a lot of hell for it because my mother is an ophthalmologist you can imagine how that went i'm not going to elaborate on that but anyhow <laughs> um, i continue to do it i stood up for myself and at first i bought into that thing about you can only do it to, during the first hour of sunrise and the last hour of sunset because that's when uv index is zero However, Akashic Records writer Andrew Bartzis once um, during a, a sp um, summer solstice, I think it was in the year 2014, um, no, I think maybe it was 2015, whatever, he said, um, get out and do some sun gazing if you can. Literally look at the sun, the system tells you to go blind, but the electromagnetic energy from the sun bypasses the physical because we're held together by electromagnetism, and it goes right to the brain to neutralize everything for the better. And, of course, standing barefoot on dirt while staying grounded is the best way to go about it. I mean, but if it's winter and it's too cold outside, then at least try to do it with a walking stick. You can't do it through a window if you got to do it indoors, but um, I don't know if what kind of, it depends on the window how much of the light gets absorbed, but if it's purely translucent, that shouldn't really be a, too much of a problem doing it indoors like in the winter but um the thing about doing it um only during the first hour of sunrise the last hour of sunset Bartz just said you 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 don't have to buy into that you can do it whenever you get up if you're a night owl that gets up at two in the afternoon um then sun gaze at two in the afternoon or do it at solar noon when it's at zenith if you want to it's okay it'll bypass the physical so um uh, a lot of people would still uh, feel kind of queasy about doing that, but hey, if Andrew Barsis can access the Akashic Records reader, records, if he um, if, if he says that the Akashic Records say, and if the Akashic Records say it, well, then it must be true, I guess, because the Akashic Records can't be tampered with. So ever since I heard him say that, I do sun gaze at um, any time of day whenever I get a chance to just look up there and... Uh, well, I think it's done me well in terms of neutralizing things in my body for the better and giving me a general boost, uh, like as a nice caffeine substitute. And paradoxically, if you do it like at sunset, um, it does give you a nice energy for the for the twilight period, but it actually helps you sleep better at night. And I've noticed uh, if you do it before Aikido, the Aikido sessions seem to run a little bit more smoothly. So it's got the key energy, of course. So what have you noticed about your experience with sun gazing? Oh, yeah. Um, so I in the beginning, I was still doing the same thing, too. I got up to about maybe uh, 20 minutes, adding 10, 10 seconds every day. And so, I mean, I was fairly well along with it. And I was actually noticing that my cal my caloric intake was down to about maybe 3000 calories a week. And I was maintaining weight, if not gaining a little bit. And it was uh, it was really interesting for all of that. But I would notice that I would be out and about, you know, walking through uh, the woods or something like that. And I would catch the sunlight through the leaves and I would just get transfixed by it. And I'd be like, well, I'm not supposed to do this right now. And yet I would feel myself getting stuck on it and I would have to look at it. And then I would feel the energetic boost from it. 
So, I mean, it was definitely a legitimate thing, and I don't have any spots in my vision. I don't have any detrimental stuff for it, but I think what you need to do is actually work at it a little bit. And so you were sun gazing for a fair amount of time before you started doing that, correct? Um, yeah, I was. So I think that's what's needed. Just a little bit of practice. Open up those pathways so that the, um, like, like he said, it bypasses the physical and it open, opens up the energetic. If those energetic pathways are not buffered, you can end up just kind of overloading them and causing them to shut down until they can rejuvenate themselves. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you just have to, uh, follow your body. If it feels comfortable for you, do it. If it doesn't, don't. Just listen. Okay. And, uh, another thing about the, uh, the body and how it reacts to nature. You mentioned the whole thing about nature clearing um, clearing the crap out of you, uh, literally, and um, I've noticed the same phenomenon. When In um, 2015 it was, um, during Independence Day weekend, I got to um, go down to um, the suburbs of Atlanta with Elizabeth Diamond Mulligan to meet this um, woman named Cynthia who happens to live on a nature lover's paradise house that's right on the hot spot of a vortex. It's got... Uh, nature galore she never kills any bugs she's got like five dogs and and um there's a lot of metaphysical stuff like crystals and stuff in there and um a lot of uh ladies were there too some lady told me it's a sign you found your divine feminine andrew but that's a side issue the point is um <laughs> you uh she, i i noticed when i was there um for about four days like the first three days even though i ate a fair amount of food when i was there i never had to take a crap and uh, some of the other people, when I brought that up, yeah, you, you notice you don't have to take a crap much when you're in nature. And they were like, yeah, I haven't had to take one to myself since I've been here. For mm -hmm. somehow, some way, the uh, nature paradise and probably all the metaphysical stuff as well is somehow getting all the stuff out of my body, which uh, forces me to not have to use the toilet. I didn't have to use it on the fourth day eventually. It did catch up with me, but it was still rather definitely unusual uh, having to uh, – not having to go for like the first uh, – three and a half days of being there and not feeling bloated. The key is nobody, none of us actually felt bloated at all, even though we had, yeah. had to take a dump. So nature has that phenomenon. So how does nature work that way? And how does that, uh, uh, how can we take advantage of that? So we don't have to use the potty and increase our water bills tremendously and not save the trees by using toilet paper and all that. So better ways to, <laughs> to use nature to clear our colons. How does this work and how can we do it better? So the Earth is a uh, completely and totally neutral energy, and so a lot of the free radicals inside of our body, it's the uh, negatively charged ions that are uh, shooting around and grabbing other electrons off, and that's kind of what causes a lot of the damage to happen inside of our body. And so if you have an overload or you're deficient in these uh, these charges right here, connecting into the Earth energetically can actually neutralize that for you, and most people have – a uh, an implanted blockage in between the flow of the planet and them energetically. And so it, you have to actually make that connection physically. And so when you go and stand on the bare earth with your uh, feet, you know, you're making that connection right there, but it's still not as a uh, clear, powerful connection as actually going out into the nature. And so you were talking about going to a highly charged energetic area. Uh, that's that's even better for that because what happens is the uh, nature itself actually starts to neutralize any type of um, uh, po uh, like an overloaded charge, I guess you could say. So it's not like even – uh, uh, neutralizing a predatory intent. It's not like the, the predatory intent is inside of you per se. It's just that um, it's more along the lines of there's more that has to be dealt with because you have to excrete it physically, if that makes sense. And so the physical nature actually energetically cleans you out. And so like everybody notices it too. You know, you'll say, well, you never notice how you get backed up like during camping, you know, you only have to go like once or twice the whole entire week that you're out there and then you come back and all of a sudden everything's going again. It's well because you're going through these shifts. You're you're going from where we're cut off from the nature, the natural cycle outside um, in the woods and then going back into the dense concrete jungle where, you know, everything's packed in, all the energy can't flow, the the feng shui is all messed up, the ley lines aren't moving correctly. And then it's it's a whole difference in your body. The belly brain actually it responds to this very, very intensely and it lets you know, hey, I like it out there. I don't like it in here. I have to process way more. And you already called it. You don't feel bloated. It's not like you are getting backed up. It's that you uh, are literally just not having as much content that you need to pass. Okay. Um, kind of a shame. I kind of had to end this interview on a crappy note in a <laughs> sense. But hey, well, it was uh, very important information right there, how to um, make the most of nature in a, in a way like that to um, 
and let your let your body come run more well with it. Um, and so, yeah, we got to get into with nature. De- definitely one of the keys to expanding consciousness, and that's one de- key way to do it without question. So, with this, that being said, um, I'm gonna d- bring the show down before I do. You can get out what you want right now and make me even make a little bit of a sales pitch out of this. Um, got the chance to uh, to explain your services and anybody that wants to listen to this and get you as a uh, as a customer client. Yeah, uh, they can reach you where they can reach you, how they can reach you, and um, maybe some of the future events that you're going to be if people want to maybe meet you there. So let's finish up on that. Yeah, definitely. So my website's unleashingnaturalhumanity.com. I have a Facebook page under the same name. And so there's actually two uh, things on Facebook under the same name. One's a group and one's a page. Uh, the group's got all kinds of lovely people inside of it. Uh, a whole bunch of people who are figuring this stuff out. A uh, great place to share techniques, comments, questions, concerns, stuff like that. It's an absolutely amazing resource. I highly recommend anybody looking into this actually go in there and talk to people who are already doing this and have been doing it. Um, my YouTube channel is Eric Pilgrim. I've got all kinds of meditations and uh, Q&As and stuff like that on uh, that as well. Um, as for future events, I'm going to be planning a conference here in Shasta like I was talking about earlier. It's going to be a, a release unlock of the body and working our way all the way up into the energy work so that people can start really connecting in on the level where I am bringing this from and so that everybody can start moving out and doing this in their life and healing themselves, healing the people around them and helping other people find the way to that light as well. Um, as for – Places I'm going to be here in the near future, uh, it's, I'm definitely here in Portland if anybody ever wants to come and meet me, but I'm going to be in contact in the desert here on, I believe that's uh, May 18th through the 22nd or the 19th through the 22nd. Uh, I'll be out there. I'm not speaking or anything. I'm just going out to meet all my people. So uh, if anybody wants to come say hi, I'll be there. Okay. Thank you very much. So um, with that being said, I, I guess I'll bring this interview to an end. It was very fascinating. I learned a few things myself, how to to take care of my life for the better and i'm sure everybody else uh when i upload this to youtube i'll try to get that done by tomorrow with the absolute latest we'll um get a chance to listen to this and make the most of it and you'll hopefully see some increase in your uh in your thickness of your pocketbook when people will uh, want to ask you to be their uh clients and customers <laughs> like to go back oh I, i'm not worried about that i got way too many clients than i can handle right now uh it's just about getting the word out there it's uh, it's yeah. about letting more people know and what you can actually do about it right Okay, and you did a good job of that. All right, so that being said, namaste, grains. Enjoy the rest of your trek throughout infinite consciousness. Take care now. All right, have a good one, Andrew.